All righty, guys. Welcome back to Becoming a Bow Hunter. Sitting here for the second time round with Mr. Jack Spinks. Welcome, sir. Yeah, mate. How you going? I'm very well. So I just had a look back. Uh, it was episode 20 that you were on for the first time round. And we talked, uh, actually, I know we talked a lot about traditional hunting in general, uh, trad bow hunting. Um, but I can't really remember full depths of our conversation. So there's chances that we might overlap. <laughs> but I think that's also all right because it's a different perspective, right? The the people have upgraded since listening to episode 20. And this time around, they're going to have a new perspective and a new angle on it and they'll take it in a different way. So if that's, that's what happens, right. that's what happens. Dude, uh, I actually want to start off. I remember maybe like a, a year or so ago, maybe a little bit longer, um, you were pulling cod out of the waterways all around you and they were white and essentially I think they were not getting aerated. Like what happened there? That was during the floods? Yeah, so um, this is a once-in-a-lifetime flood, which has happened three times in the last 11 years. Um <laughs> It's just basically when the river floods, uh, it, it gathers all the leaf litter out of all the forests and and that. And all that does is essentially just drags it back into the system. Uh, and that basically turns into like a big cup of tea, just mm. takes all the oxygen out of the water. And um, essentially anything that's in the water that needs oxygen dies. Um, yeah, wow. All the crayfish. So the first one happened back in, I think, 2011. Um, so all that crayfish... Uh, they just left the water. So, like on our river where we live here, we've always had good numbers of crayfish and cod, and you know, beautiful, pristine sort of ecosystem here. But yeah, that 2011, um, you could go to any sandbar, any river bank, and there could be you know 500 crayfish. They just walk up the bank and they can't go back in the river; they just die. Um, oh wow! That starts first. Then you've got about a 48 to 70, I say, oh, 72 hour window from when. Um, the cods start to show themselves to when they're dead. So what will happen is um, they all start to head upstream trying to find oxygen. Well, that's what we found. None. We never saw any going downstream. I had two bushes here at the back of my house because um, I, was, I was just going to work and I started seeing them because I knew the flood was up. I knew it was going to happen. The water was sort of starting to change colour. Mm -hmm. um, first cod we pulled out, uh, just out of curiosity, it was a metre 25. Jesus. Um, and it, he was dead, but that was the big fellas died first. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, these two bushes, uh, they're only about oh, six feet apart. But in 48 hours, I watched at least 10,000 cod swim between those two bushes at the back of my house, um, you know, within sort of six feet of the bank. So they all come to the bank, um, not too sure, but they all the fish will come to the bank and they'll basically stick their heads out of the water and they'll just try and breathe our oxygen. Um mm. Yeah, it's essentially if I, the only way to describe it is if I took your oxygen away now, you know, where could you go? Exactly. What would you do? Yeah. Right. Um, so we saw, we saw them. Um, we started scooping them up. Um, so, yeah, I can go to the pub now and tell someone I've caught five and a cod on the weekend, you know, and um, <laughs> that's basically what happened. Um, so, yeah, we just, I made a big lot of canning net, a um, bit of like, bit of, um, a big fire glass rod about 20 foot long and a big um, bit of chicken wire. Mm -hmm. And you basically just weigh it out there and you just put it in that swimming pool and you get three or four cod at a time. And we were taking them back and we had air raiders set up in our sheds, like um, fish tanks and that. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, we just went hell for leather for three or four days, you know, trying and catch everything. Then uh, a couple of good mates, um, Matty Heslop, he's a bloke that's been fishing here forever, um, mm -hmm. and Josh Dan, one of the local boys, they um they organised some air raiders and um unfortunately too late you know because you've only got a small window but exactly, just yeah. we had um Ausfish crew out of Mildura they came out one day and they had air raiders on the back of the Utes and um we went just went around catching cod stuck them in their air raiders and we only had a short window because they had the by the time they could leave um, pick the fish up fish could only be in the tank for a certain amount of time they had a two-hour drop to get back so we could only catch a certain amount but mm. um you know we're catching things like we we started leaving the little ones because it was thousands and millions of those and we just sort of started aiming for the big girls but yeah like in one of our crop paddocks there we were you know catching cod in the middle of the wheat crop you know the wheat crop just the heads of the wheat crop were just out of the water and you could see the cod you know swimming through that then um i had a up where I've got a pig sty, um, we got a bit of three-inch poly that used to um, supply our cattle yards and that. And I had that just shooting into the river. Like the river was gone black. Like it's yeah. just goes 
explodes overnight. Literally, it's an explosion. Um, goes black overnight. Explosion um, of what? Uh, there's, there's lots of um, theories on it, but I think the main theory is when this is like it's never happened before because it's only when we've started, you know, rooting around with the, the water and that sort of stuff. But so water goes into the state forest and naturally water wants to break down everything it touches. So it wants to break down all the leaf litter. Mm. But when it goes into the state forest, um, there's too much of it, right? Yeah. So there's way too much leaf litter. You'll see the water change a bit, but the water, it's almost like a living organism goes, right, oh, we can't break down this much um, leaf material. Mm -hmm. So it just goes dormant. Just doing it, so the, you know, and um, but the problem is then, like you get a warm day, um, that certainly doesn't help. But then what happens is a fresh flow of water, so that would like another flush is like you give the water um, hundred red bulls, yeah, and it goes beautiful. All this stuff that we've been sort of hanging on to, we've just got a fresh lease on life, and it goes, it literally just goes bang, it explodes, mm -hmm. breaks down all that leaf litter in one hit. Then Fire. that enters the river stream and uh, river system. Then that's that's when the damage starts. And like from start to finish, like it could only be two, two, three weeks. You know, yep. the river is bad from when it's dangerous. Um, then yeah, so I had the the poly shooting out in the in the river where it was black, and um, just trying to do everything we could. We had blokes here that had their tinnies going flat out, had houseboats going flat out, just trying to create water, and. Um, First day, nothing was happening. I was like, oh, fuck, you know, you've seen all these fish go past, going to die. And the next day I went back and there was there was an acre of metallic green under this this tap. Like I obviously created enough oxygen and there was just a big blanket of cod, like this, you know, they were just every gap was filled from, you know, me to cod to little cod to everything. Just trying to breathe. Yeah, the problem was... Um, Oxygen works, so they got a guts full of oxygen. Yep, beauty. Then they pissed off again, headed upstream, and obviously there was no oxygen for, you know, it could have been at least 150 k's of river before there would have been any more air raiders or anyone else doing anything. Yeah. They all died. They all floated back downstream. Um, hmm. We we pumped straight out of the river. So we yep. got a sand filter, but um, we pumped straight out of the river. And the water was so bad that when we were showering, my eyes were burning. You know, like they were literally, your eyes were just like you'd someone throwing petrol in them. And that was just from the decaying fish in the river. And no um, my daughter, like she was only, I can't remember, might have been two months old. Yeah. You know, so we couldn't couldn't bathe her in that water. So we used all our rainwater we had um, here, like bathing her, you know, a couple times a day. Then we run out of rainwater. So we had to like mm. get rainwater brought in but the problem with that was um the water was crossing both our tracks we were landlocked on the farm um luckily we had four wheel drive use that sort of stuff we had to actually drive up on our um, channel banks and that but no one could get in with a truck to deliver water luckily we had a couple of other um tanks on the farm that we could get fresh water from but like we'd come home and um in the ute and it'd be like dolphins in front of the ute, like swimming up the road because we're in the water up to the, up to the bloody bulba. And it was yeah. just cod, just going. No way. Then, yeah, after that day, you know, four or five, and, you know, when, when it really sort of went to shit, they just everything dead. Just there was dead cod everywhere. As far as you can see, you go to a bank where the water sort of comes in around, um, not a bit of backwater or something like that. Mm -hmm. and it could be anywhere between two to 300 dead cod, you know, in, you know, for, sort of 40, 50 square metres. That's insane. Um, yeah, like it happened in 2011, then happened in 2016, and it's happened again um, since 2016. Uh, never saw a crayfish then, so after the first lot. Yeah. Um, never saw a crayfish again. Uh, never heard of any being caught. Then this this year, um, I think we found maybe five on wow. our farm. We had, um, yeah, five, and they obviously... They're all cactus too, you know. Um, yeah. But yeah, unfortunately, mate, um, nothing we can do about it. So, oh, there's, there's things we can do. The, one of the local fellows in Swan Hill, he had his, um, what do you call it? He had his boat paddle steamer going in um, one of the marinas there. Mm. And he was testing the oxygen levels in the water. And he proved that 
with that, he was able to keep enough oxygen in the marina to keep fish alive there. No way. So they, you just had videos and they were just all hanging around his boat. And um, through that and through Maddie Heslop and Josh, we were able to get funding um, through our local fishing clubs that to actually have air aid set up now. So they're all in the shed. But if anything happens like this again, we've got access now to actually save all the air raiders. Yeah. Um, so if we know black water's coming, we just go and you know plonk them wherever. Um, we did a did a um, an ABC interview with it. That didn't do much like it. Um, yeah. You know, it didn't really raise raise too much awareness, but um, it's one of those things like if it was a sea turtle or a bloody, you yeah, know, something like that, you know, everyone would be throwing their arms up. But just because it's Murray Cod, um, no one really gave a shit. But all the yellow brothers, they died too. Um, basically, everything in the river just died, and except for the carp, and then the carp flourished. Like we had, um, uh, like it was not uncommon to see like carp finglings. Um, like a, a school of carp finglings non-stop at the back of the house for about a week. Like no, that's right. it. Yeah. All about, you know, four inches long, even goldfish, like they were yeah. even gold. Um, continuous school for, yeah, you just stop looking like continuous, just keep going. What and that's because the, <clears throat> it would have been perfect for the yellow bell and the cod, like breeding wise, because it was at the right time for breeding season that they could have gone off, laid their eggs in the, they reckon the ideal, um, don't quote me on this, but they reckon the ideal way for the yellow belly and cod to the spawn is they go up into flooded areas. When mm-hmm. it floods, they can go and flood up there and it's safe or something. And yeah, okay. Everything hatches, comes back in the system. But unfortunately, they, <coughs> they all died, but all the carp did that as well. And, mate, the amount of carp, like, I was just bow fishing, like, you know, you just get sick of shooting them. Yeah. <laughs> um, we got lagoons on our place, so all our lagoons filled up. Um, no way. I spent about... A couple of days, um, so every about every 10,000 uh, cart that went past, there was a little gold one. You yeah. Know? I don't know why, they're just goldfish. So I was out with my bow for bloody hours in the sun trying to shoot these goldfish. Yeah, because I've never <laughs> heard of anyone else bow fishing goldfish. Well, the small ones, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, eventually got one. That's what I say to everyone. Everyone can hit the big ones, but no one can hit the little fellas. Yeah, know? exactly. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, mate, it's just a shit show, to be honest. Yeah, like, that's um, insane, yeah. Best best one that came out was a meter forty five. Um, anything where between you know eighty to hundred pound of cod, um, and I love fishing. Eating, you're right. The biggest problem is though, mate. Like I can't fish for shit, obviously, because I can't catch fish in my river. But there was obviously plenty there. Yeah, yeah. You know, they were everywhere. But um, so I just bought a new boat. Um, yeah. Bought a new boat. I was fishing here because last season was going to be shit hot, I reckon, for fishing. And um, I haven't even put in water now. You know, yeah. we, we don't go fishing because there's literally no point unless you want to go fight carp all day. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. did, you, did you actually save uh, a fair few, like the ones that you had aerated in your shed and stuff? Are they kind of back in the system now? Or Yeah, so what happens is um, they went to the Ozfish crew. They take mm-hmm. them back to Mactura and because um, they're white, they literally go white. Yeah. You know? yeah. So, they're metallic green normally and they just go white. So, it's like when they're swimming through the water, it's like black water. And uh, then you see this white shadow almost. It's creepy as shit, but um, mm. you put them in, the, in fresh water um, and the guys, yeah, at Oz Fish, they took them back to Mildura and they stuck them in all the farms, fish farms. Yeah. And they got, got them back to full health and they released them back in the river system there. So, you know, they might end up back here one day or whatever. But God, uh, geez, not like bring them back. Yeah. No, like I thought they were going to, um, but by the time... Our river was healthy enough to take the fish. It was would have been way too late anyway. Like they would have had to yeah, keep them there, and the capacity that they had, they probably they could have had thousands of cod that they saved. Mm. And um, you know they can't take them back everywhere. So they, I think they just released them to the the nearest clean waterway, and that would have been yeah probably the Murray down there at Mildura. Um, That's insane. What's our what's our like? I don't know much about the the fishing side. I know that Murray cod are protected at certain times of the year. Um, do you know much around that? Like when you can fish them, when you can't, and what the, the process is with that? Uh, you just can't um, can't fish when they're um, spawning. Uh, yeah, so when it's um, cod season. So I can't remember the exact dates. Um, yeah, it could be something like September to start of December or something. I, I can't remember. Yeah, okay. exactly. um, but yeah, it, unfortunately, that was right when the black water came through. So. It was just a shit show altogether, mate. Um, 
And yeah, like my grandfather, he's lived on the river. He's 90, I don't know how old he's now, he's 95 or something, but um, he's lived on the river his whole life. He tells stories, oh man, when he was kids, he remembers the river was dry, but then he also remembers when the river was crystal clear. Mm. And you could see the, you know, see the cod under the logs and they lived off fish. You know, that was their diet. They had, um, okay. like, see photos, which is horrifying now, but it's just how it was. But you'll see them back when they were my age, they'd have a clothesline, you know, full of cod or anywhere from 80 to a metre, you know. Wow. Just, but that's every fish was in that area because the rib system was so healthy and so clean. They weren't so, um, so hard to find. Yeah. And, you know, they took a heap of fish out of the river, but for some reason, <clears throat> the river was nice and healthy. It was clean. Um, obviously, plenty of fish, but mm. he'd never seen the black water until 2011. That's insane. Yeah. Yeah, I tried to have a quick Google to see if I could find something, but um, it's hard to listen and search at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> it make it a bit tough to be able to try to find. I'd, I'd love to know the actual, like, what's the chemical release that's happening. It's, it's called hypoxia. White oxia. White oxia. Hypoxia. Hypoxia. Blackwater hypoxia, I think they name it now. That's what you name it now? Yeah, I just call it shit show, mate. That's all I call it. <laughs> See if anything comes up. Yeah, just pretty much exactly what you said, like just low oxygen. So blackwater yeah. is um, water that has become low in dissolved oxygen, which is what they actually need, right, to be able to, to, be able to yeah. breathe in. It occurs when large amounts of organic material uh, in rivers are broken down by bacteria. These bacteria multiply and use up the oxygen in the water. So that's the that's the part that the actual explosion is, is the bacteria. Yeah, yeah. yeah got you. Okay, wow. Yeah. That's crazy. A lot of people think there's, you know, there's a lot of different theories on it. Everyone had a different theory. A lot of people reckon when the floods were, um, you know, when it was all the chemical drums and fuel drums and, you know, all sorts of shit like that, all the litter, um, you know, leaking in the river system was doing it. But, um, yeah, you, you could ask a hundred different people, you get a hundred different, you know, exactly. answers. Um, yeah. Fortunately, but hopefully um, we try to make a bit of a noise, like about what happens and, you know, why it happens and, you know, what we're losing. Um, we seem to get a pretty bad year. I don't know what, I spoke to a few other people, locals and, yeah, only 15, 20 Ks down the road there, they won't get the same result, you know, and everybody mm. leads into theirs. Mm -hmm. uh, and it uh, wasn't so bad, but everyone would have seen the photos like on the Darling, you know, down near Wentworth and that sort of stuff where there was just like cod, you know, laid for bloody 100 kilometres um, yeah. just up and down the river. But it's one of those things, mate, <laughs> keeps happening. No one does anything about it. Um, no one seems to care about it, but except fishermen, you know, yeah. the greenies didn't give a fuck. <laughs> Oh, no, yeah. nor do they um, ever, right, yeah. about most things, unless it's solar power. Fucking. Oh, I should, <laughs> like... yeah. I should just put the photo up of a bloody, if I had a, you know, pet sea turtle or something, I should have just found a photo of that and stuck it in the river and said, this is what I found. Exactly. You know, then we'd have everything so then, wouldn't we? <laughs> so what, like, do you have a theory as to what the answer would be? Like, is it more burning off? Is it more, like, what would you do to kind of stop it from happening again? Um. So essentially all it is is just people fucking around with the water. Um, Got you. You know, back in the day, water was able to flow freely from, you know, one end of the body from the mountain, you know, out of the mouth. Mm -hmm. It's all this stuff where now we're, we're building, um, you know, people with banks, building banks. So everything essentially is, you know, people want to stop water from going places, but they don't want water to go elsewhere. So they're putting banks up, you know, building dams, um, you know, just essentially just, playing God when it comes to water. You know, everyone yeah. just wants a piece yeah. of it. And, uh, yeah, instead of just letting it do its own thing, like for 100 years, you know, or 200, like, you know, forever, it's probably just done the same thing. When a flood comes, the water goes up, rushes out that quick, you know, it doesn't have time to have that explosion. Mm -hmm. But because we're banked up everywhere downstream, you know, it's a sort of double-edged sword. Like um, there was a section, can't remember, one of the weirs here somewhere was holding the water up. But if they didn't hold the water up, I think it was might have been Manum in South Australia would have flooded. Like that town would flood. So yeah. by holding water up, you're saving towns and you're saving lives, I suppose. But then you're also killing all the fish. So it's, you know, you got to weigh those options up too. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, 
But yeah, but the silly thing too, mate, like is none of the farmers had allocations for water really. So like we've got all this water in the system, way too much. It's wrecking houses. You know, we had 50 mil um, from our sandbags before it was coming in the house. And hmm. you wouldn't like, ideally you'd say, right, eh? all your farmers, they've got turkey nests, big dams, irrigation, you know, you know, a dry lake, pump it, you know, pump water yeah. into it. You know, yeah. Let's try and slow some of the water down. You're not going to slow it all down, but, you know, let's take a bit of pressure off and hopefully someone can benefit from it. But definitely, um, too much money, I think, is involved with water, mate. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Some of the people that hold the most water um, are people that don't have farms. So it's just all a currency sort of thing. And unfortunately, <coughs> it will happen again. Yeah, definitely. And it will keep happening. Um, yeah, it's just one of those things we, yeah, you sort of bite your tongue and deal people, with it. But people trying to capitalize, right? It's um, it's unfortunate. Oh, there's always someone wants something for something, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, my, um, my brother, he was living, or both my brothers were living down in South Australia, so they were near the mouth. So they were getting the other end of the spectrum, and um, we were in trouble. Like the water was coming up, and we looked at the banks here. Like, I could literally, if I was passing for a piss, I could piss out my back door in the river, you know, and that's mm -hmm. how close the water was. And there was cod there, you know, cod just sitting in the back of the house dying. You know, the dogs were bringing up dead cod, and my brother rang up to there, he's going, and I said, ah, oh, yeah, we're right, should be right, and my girlfriend was panicking, her mum was panicking, you know, everyone's panicking, just like, oh, shit yourself too, thinking, you what, know, what this is, is it's yeah. coming up, coming up, coming up. Anyway, so they scooted home and they gave us the hand to sandbag and that sort of stuff. And um, if we hadn't a sandbag, I reckon we would have got in trouble. Luckily we did. Mm. Um, but yeah, a lot of other people that did sort of lose a lot of country, lose a lot of crop, uh, mm. houses, all sorts of shit. But um, yeah, don't fuck with Mother Nature, I reckon. Just let it be. No, yeah, it's pretty interesting. My um my family's block got done up at Gimpy and they I think it was 74 or 73 they had a they had a flood that came through and they put a they put a tent like a big um star picket pole in just to say like this is where the watermark came to. And um my granddad's cousin, no, uh yeah, I think it's that I think it works that way. My granddad's cousin work, lives next door. And he was like, look, in 73 or 74, I remember saying this is the highest we'll ever see the water. And he's like, yeah, now we've seen it go past that point four times now in the last 10 years with those floods that have come through. And he's like, it's just, yeah, it's absolutely crazy as to what has happened. But this last one in particular, like the creeks that they had there are five metres wide. They're now like 30 metres wide just from the difference that the land mass, like it just, the water just rips the land mass up. It's crazy to see. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and that's the problem too, mate, like, Everyone down here too was like we. I think it was the seventy six flood here. Um, where I'm sitting right now, there was a, a foot of water, hmm. and um, my grandfather said, "When you look out from the front of the house, when the water's going over the top of the fences, that's when you're about to get wet." And yeah, so I'm sitting there having a cup of watching the water. You know? <laughs> I was like, Sorry, but, but then then my old man popped us and goes, "Well, for starters, mate, those fences weren't there back in seventy six. So I was like, "Well, that's great," and everyone that's Everyone that put pegs in in 76 or 74, like when the last flood was. Yeah. Everyone's like, oh, it's, it's gone over them. It's gone over them. Well, for starters, a lot of people put them in live trees. So you can only imagine what happened then. You know, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Um, but because everyone's stuck in, you know, downstreams have been blocked up and people have put in bigger dam walls and, you know, you know, so the water naturally, Back you can't really compare up. it because. Yeah. Yeah, instead of flowing out like it normally, like the river system isn't the same as 76. So you, no, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so one person said to me, he said, floods come in doubles. So they reckon mm. next year is going to be even worse. Um, oh, wow. Because they reckon in 75 was bad, then 76 topped it here. So I might just move. <laughs> <laughs> might be the saving, saving grace. Yeah, move up north. There's, yeah, um, but anyway, I mate. It's all crack building. Yeah, it's like it's, it's a crazy world. And I honestly didn't think that was going to like I wasn't I knew that it was a thing, I wasn't sure to the depths of it. Um, so it's kind of cool to unpack it a little bit because I think there's a lot of that side of conservation that no one ever hears about. And I think realistically, the hunting world of people that do actually care versus you move on to like you said, the greenies, <laughs> they don't give a fuck. Like nah. like I said, they're That's pushing, true. yeah, wind towers and solar power, and it's not going to do anything for us, but 
Um, there was actually a story I heard in California where people were messing with the rivers essentially to help. It was to help water their weed crops. It was like uh-huh. essentially the gangs. And it was the only way that the, the feds could catch them because they could realize that the water source had been so messed with. Um, like it was not drizzling into the town or whatever or the way it was meant to. So like, well, there's something between this town and that town that's going on with our water source. So they'd go and they'd do the big like air surveillances and everything. And sure enough, they'd find these massive crops of weed <laughs> from the, the cartel over there. <laughs> Pretty crazy. Creepy <laughs> uh, buggers. Yeah, well, yeah, I wouldn't say anything about that. I would just turn around and walk away. Not those buggers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't want to mess with that. Yeah, um, go and have a look at that. So, dude, um, I thought it'd be sweet to get you back on and talk a little bit for the uh, the trad crew. I haven't I haven't given them a lot of love recently. It's something that I've always got. The, the, it's kind of like what drew me into archery to start with and something I definitely plan on going back to. But one question I have for you, because you, you definitely had a few different bows in your time, is what what is your process of like finding a good bow when it comes to... Um, to a traditional bow or a recurve like what are you kind of looking for what's what's the specs that you go for uh it's, it's like anything mate it's like rifles it's like cars um everyone's sort of drawn towards a certain brand simply because they've either got a good reputation or you know someone else has got one and said it was good you know um biggest thing is always just shoot one find mm. someone that's got a bow you know that you know you might want to have a try like you're going to in the, in the camp and there could be 10 blokes with stick bows, you know, they're all going to have a different one or yeah. just shoot. Um, but then a lot of it comes down to, if you know the boyer who makes them, um, you know, like some companies recently um, have had a couple of shit shows because um, you get a lot of a lot of companies, especially social media now, I won't know who they are, but everyone should know. But um, when you start making t- too many things, Corners get cut, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And down the track, they're biting the ass. So there's been a couple of companies that have done that, which have been, you know, had good reputations for, you know, hundreds of years, you know, uh, or not that long, but yeah, it's been for a long time. And yeah. um, I wouldn't even touch on a 10 foot pole now, you know, mm-hmm. and I was a huge fan. Um, pretty much, like I said, a lot of blokes, if you want to know anything about traditional bowling, what gear to use, um, what bow to use, you know, how to do don't go into an archery store um, mm. because in Australia, no one gives a shit about traditional bar. It's simple as that. Yeah. And anyone, and like not to bloody bag archery stores, but 99% of them don't care about traditional bowling. They barely carry anything to do with traditional bowling. And the people that are working there don't really know anything about it. No, so, because yeah, exactly. it's not money in it. All yeah. the money's in, you know, um, 2024 Hoyt Bow that's about to come in. Yeah. <laughs> um, go and, Go and speak to someone that does it all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, speak to someone that's, you know, successful, that, that hunts. Not someone that shoots two nanny goats a year, right? No. Um, <laughs> go and speak to someone and ask them. <laughs> a lot of blokes will tell you too. Like, they might go, I'm using this bow, but it's a piece of shit. It drives me nuts, you know. I just can't mm-hmm. afford to get another one. Or, um, some of the best bows you can buy, a lot of people that come to me and go, right, I want to buy, you know, I want a stick bow. What do I get? I said, well, how much do you want to spend? It's like, oh, not much because I... Good. All right, at least tell me. So get on eBay. You can pick up Samic Red Stag. It's a one-piece recurve, 60-inch mm-hmm. long. That's around 50 bucks. And I know blokes who've had that bow for bloody 10 years, and it's been absolutely unreal, right? Yeah, you awesome. can spend the same money on different things, delaminate and blow up. Um, go and buy one of them. If you like it, come back and talk to me, and we'll go, right, hey, if you want to either jump into a you know, $2,000, $2,500 bow, mm-hmm. Bob your uncle, if you don't, you've got a three hundred and fifty dollar bow sitting exactly. in your shed. You haven't lost big money. Um, you can always give it to a mate or flog it off for a box of beer. You know, you're not out of pocket. Um, but for me, um, I'm I'm a big fan of G10 now, um, mm-hmm. which is just the material and the risers because um, we're we're pretty rough on our gear now, like we never yeah. used to be. But um, if you get a good bow, it can be used as a workhorse, work tool. What's going on here? I've sort of gone back to stalker stick bows now. I know oh, Sam I just, personally. I just, no. I just lost you real quick. Tell me again. You, you pretty much said that you're pretty rough on on the new on the gear compared to what we used to be. 
yeah, I'll, just hunting rods, mate. Like I always used to baby my bows. You know, I used to really um, care, for, like be careful. Man. You know, you never get any action with them, you know, because you're too yeah. busy looking after your bow. It's like when we used to ride motorbikes. Best thing you do when you got a new motorbike helmet, is show you the boxes, start on the ground, and see you got a scratch on it. Then <laughs> you don't worry about it. Yeah. So it's not the same with bows. Yeah. Um, so yeah, then I um I sort of went back to stalker because we we were going um overseas on a pretty expensive trip, you know, once in a lifetime trip, and mm-hmm. I didn't really have the right sort of bow um for the trip. It was going to be cold, oh, like fucking minus thirty or something. So it was going to be cold. Yeah, wow. And, um, I didn't. I sat on online. I said, Rodo, who do I want? You know, if money wasn't an option. Who would I get to make me a boat? And I rattled off all the companies. I was like, well, I've never used that one. Um, I've heard bad things about that one. I know I'd like to use this one, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Then, um, yeah, fell back on the stalkers. I've had a stalker for a long time and, you know, ended up getting a couple made. And um, I'm getting pretty picky now on gear. So I mm-hmm. had a couple of boats built. Um, wasn't quite right this one, so I flogged it off. Got something else made from South. Um and just kept going and landed up with a pretty sort of neat boat now and sort of found something that I like that sort of mm. suits me the most. And, um, yeah, <clears throat> we'll stick with that. Um, but, yeah, there's – it is a double-edged sword. It is hard. It's like um, a lot of people buying for egos. A lot of people uh, fantasize about a certain brand because they've mm-hmm. always wanted one, Yeah, you know. Um, but best thing you do is, yeah, go and ask someone that – Hunts of like going ask Ash Brown, um, Benny Fenson, um, Toby Hines, yeah. you know, Jeremy Kelly, those boys go and ask all them, um, you know, and, and they'll tell you, you know, and you can't deny what they're saying because of their history, their success with the stick bow, exactly. So, right. them plenty as well, yes. So, a lot of it, a lot of stick bows, like there's some obviously the machine made, there's a lot that are still handmade as well. Like, it, it, do you see a big difference? Obviously, the um, continuity or consistency of a bow that is handmade, I don't know, is it more consistent or less consistent than machine made? Uh, well, I've seen a lot of machine bow, uh, machine made bows, mate, that fucking don't look like they're oh, machine. Yeah. Oh, they just, they don't line up. Once you start machining, like you, you've taken, taken someone out of the, you know, production line, you know, you've yeah. taken the skill set away. Um, you know, they still shoot good, you know, don't get me wrong. But if you want to look at um Rob Nichols flatline bows up in northern Queensland, I think where he lives, like he mate, I have never shot one of his bows, so I can't, you know, um I'm gonna have to get one, but he does everything hand by hand and basically and he puts all these unbelievable like he'll put a hundred pieces of wood together in one riser. And it wow. could be a seam, a crocodile, or a wedgie, or you know, absolutely phenomenal. Um, so you got that boat that's all handmade, then you've got um, sort of like Colin Gar's bows, they're all handmade as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so he'll sit on file, and you know, you'd probably find that those bows will outlast m- machine made bows. That was my thought because yeah. there's, there's no no one skipped a step, no. Um, when you've got a, just for example, if you've got a CNC blade that cuts out the riser, you know, you just stick it on there, walk away, press a button, cuts the riser out. Whereas these other handmade bows, but these boys, you know, all done by a file or, you know, bandsaw, you know, mm-hmm. they're the sort of bows that you're going to want to buy um, to hand down to your grandchildren and that. Yeah. Um, if you want a bow that you can turn over fast, yeah, go and buy a machine made bow, go and buy a Hoyt's Tory. They're, you know, they could be loud. Might be super pretty, might be super neat, but you know, if you want something for bashing through the bush and you know, donging a pig on the head when he's too close, yeah, and you don't <laughs> want to scratch a good boat, yeah, go and get one that's sort of made of metal. <laughs> that's hilarious. Um, yeah, I, I one, actually, actually, one of my cousins does gun stocks and he'll charge anywhere between like three to I think six thousand dollars for a gun stock. Shit. I'm like, whoa, I'm like, that's a that's a fair chunk of money, right? And he's like, it is, but I spend 60 to 80 hours on each one. Uh it's perfectly measured in weight. Like he's got different elements of the the stock. So depending on how you're holding it, it balances the gun out completely perfectly and stuff. And he's like, it's a it's an art form. He's like it's really and and really it's like the I think any any style of specialized work like that you you are going to pay a lot of money for it because it it's it's to a purpose and i think realistically someone who's putting 
in the time and effort with their hands. They, and I mean, it's something like, for instance, with your work that you do with your, even your cutting boards and your, ta- your tables and stuff, right? Like it's always pristine level that you're working towards. It's not, and it's probably going to be a, a repeatable process. Not the machine doesn't necessarily do a repeatable process, but like you said, you're taking out that, that human care for the product. Yeah. 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 When you, when you take that out, that's, you know, like, <laughs> For example, like for example, these these boat companies, right? So social media blows everyone up. You know, someone it's a super social media hero. Yeah, you know, they'll get a boat, and everyone wants that boat, right? Mm-hmm. So the first yeah. company's going to do that, right? Oh, beautiful. Because of this boat, I've got ten times the orders I have now. Um, yeah, I'm going to make a shitload of money. How do I maximise this? And they go, right? We'll we'll take someone out of the line. We'll yeah, we've got the money now coming in. We've got the revenue. Why don't we go and buy this machine? And this will make our boats faster. Yeah, you know, then the line of boats gets popular, and they say, "Well, all mates using it. everyone else is buying one." Yeah, you know, let's you know let's go and get another. You know, then the next person wants one, and all of a sudden, you know, skip start, um, steps start getting skipped. Um, you know, one racing company they got a bad batch of glue. You know, I don't know how many bows they built with that bad batch of glue, but no, yeah, there was just bows blowing up everywhere. That's you horrible. Yeah. yeah, everywhere like blokes were getting getting a brand new boat, spending a couple of grand. And limbs blow up, and like, right, get a replacement set of limbs, and replacement set will blow up. Fuck. Yeah. And um, I actually bloody had to email them. So guys, I'm getting you know anywhere from five to ten messages a week. What's going on? What do I tell these people? You know, is it the humidity? You know, is it our, our climate? And they're just like, no, nah, we had a bad batch of glue. <clears throat> and I was like, well, that's you know, that's all good and well, and I you know appreciate you owning up to it, but. You know, what's, that's what's going to happen. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. What, someone's going to save all this money and, you know, going on. I know a couple of boys that were going on a hunting trip, a trip of a lifetime. And, you know, a couple of weeks out, they go to shoot their bow and it's got a big white line down the guts and, you know, starts to laminate. Um, and that's like a reason why I'm not too keen on um, like these new carbon limbs because carbon limbs come out and they were super popular because certain couple of blokes, you know, were using it. Everyone's like, got to get them. And um, I said to the blokes that were building, I said, have you tested them in Australia? And they're like, no, no, they're right. I said, well, where we hunt gets up to 50 degrees, right? Mm. If you've got a black limb out the sun that isn't shiny, that, you know, it's just matte and will just absorb heat, what do you think is going to happen? And they're like, oh, we, we cook them in the oven up to bloody, you know, whatever degrees. They're like, yeah, right, no worries. Um, but just shit like that, like, how about you go and send them to someone no, you know, sort of, respond. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of someone like um, you know, for example, you've saved your money up, you know, collecting cans or whatever. Um, you know, extra money just to go and buy this because you want to go on a trip of a lifetime and you get there, then you fucking limb blows up. Yeah, you know? exactly. So you've got to be careful with who you get a bow from. Um, biggest thing is make sure you got warranty. Um, yeah, use your stringers, use all the stuff, don't because um, it's it, like anything, mate, like cars, like there's a lot of ways to avoid warranties with both. Yeah. Um, you know, and boys, are, they're clever. They are clever. If you show them a photo of a riser or a limb and there's something wrong with it, they'll say the only way it is from a dry fire. And, yeah, gotcha. you know, people try and say, oh, it just it blew up in the car. You know, I remember someone in South Cox sent me a photo because I think I sold a boat to them through south and they said, oh, the limb's blown up. I was like, oh, yeah, right, oh, shit, sorry, mate. Um, I'll speak to south and we'll organise a replacement set. Can I get a photo? Send me through a photo. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, south, he, he rang me or something. He said, mate, the only way that limb's ever possibly able to blow up like that is from a dry fire. And yeah, I eventually spoke to, um, I think it was old mate's friend. I said, oh, you know, he had trouble with his bow. He said, yeah, no, he dry fired a couple of times at Lingler, you know, so <laughs> trying to pull the wool out of their eyes. Um, yeah. yeah, they're pretty clever because they, they build the bows themselves. Exactly. So, um, they know like how it works. Yeah, bow roll. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, in, in, in regards to you know, your bows in general, do you keep them strung or you always unstring them and string them up every time you go use them? Um, I always leave my strong, mate. Um, always have. Uh, I think the data shows that one bar I've got, I think over 20 years, it might lose one pound. Yeah, well, in, okay. In draw weight. Um, 99% of the problems I've seen with any bow is done from stringing and unstringing. 
Okay. Right? Yeah. Well. Uh, even with stringers, I hate stringers. You meant to use them. I don't. I should. Um, yeah. I, I, I twist it around my legs, which is like, people yeah, say it's the worst leg way. lock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I um, when I do it, like my limbs are perfectly straight, so there's no issue. I've been doing it forever and never had any issue. The only yeah. bar I've ever had an issue with was one that I used a stringer on. Okay. Um, but if you use a stringer right, you should be fine. But um, I always leave my strung uh, unless. I'm not going to be using it for 12 months um, or if it's going to be stupid hot because I've just got to shed um, with all my stuff. And if it's going to be 50 degrees or something, you know, I might go and I'm stringing because bows being strung with heat definitely isn't ideal. Um, definitely. Yeah. Never, when you hang a bow, if you just hang it by either the riser mm -hmm. or by the string, you're perfectly fine. Just make sure that it's hanging evenly. Like you don't want it like one end of the bow and, you know, you want everything sort of perpendicular and even, and yeah. that's fine. If you leave it on the tip, like lean up against the corner of your room, yeah, the limbs will twist and they'll go to shit. Oh, wow. Uh, quite yeah, easy. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so never never leave your bows lean up against something. Always hang them. And you always recommend um, two hooks rather than just one, like when you're hanging on the string, for instance. Yeah, so when you, what I do is I just grab two um, planks of wood with a heap of deer and just had them probably uh, 20 inches apart. Yeah, and so my right sits on the um, mm. pegs instead of the string. But then there's also sections where the bows, some bows sit on the string. But if it's just sitting there evenly, um, they're perfectly fine. And I've had bows strung for shit. I've had one bow strung for probably nearly ten years. You know, oh, and yeah. no issues with it whatsoever. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely reckon that keeping them strung saves people. Yeah, if you're traveling, like if you're going to be traveling, um, yeah, understand you don't want them strung in the car. Because cars can reach stupid heads. You don't want them strung and put in a bow case, but then have shit chucked on top of your bow case because mm. you just got to remember they are under tension. If you, like anything, if you bend something under tension and leave it for long enough, it's going to stay like Yeah. Um, yeah. So if I'm going, you know, if I go up north to go pig shooting or something, if I'm driving, you know, anywhere from up 12 hours, I'll actually have my bow strung with the arrows in the passenger seat. You know, so yeah, I can yeah. make sure the weight's okay because it's pretty pointless driving 12 hours if you get there and your boat's <laughs> I actually, that's the exact same way I travel even with my compound bow. It's purely just because I don't have a case for it yet, like a travel case. So all I do is I chuck it in my yep. in my car seat. I know it's safe. I'm like, okay, we're good to go. Yep. Yeah. Put a seat belt over it. Yeah, yep. exactly. can only have so many passengers because the boat's yep. taking <laughs> one of my seats. <laughs> 100%. Yeah. You got to look after them. Oh, definitely, man. It's exactly like you said, right? If you're driving anywhere like even if you're driving four hours you get somewhere and you can't you can't shoot you're gonna be absolutely devastated so oh well i talked to mark pitts um from mark's from quivers um he had a longbow that he got built custom one he got all over new zealand packed in walked in for i don't know two days got there unpacked camp went and draw his bow back and his limb broke you know That's a he didn't yeah. do anything wrong, just that was going back to, you know, different companies doing different bows and that sort of stuff. But um, I always now, or I have for probably the last 10 years, is take a second bow everywhere I go. Yeah, okay. Second bow. I've got a, a Thunderhawk bow. It, it's a three-piece, packs into, oh, I can nearly fit inside of one of those Safari Tough quivers. Um, yeah. Like a back quiver. I can nearly fit in that. I just take it with me everywhere. I may not use it, but... It probably weighs <clears throat> less than a kilo. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I just always take it because you never know what happens. I was, like, yeah. One day I was in the territory with Randy and um, we, shit started getting a bit sideways and as shit does between with he and I, like, we'll just get being a bit stupid. And, um, <laughs> Too many runs. Chasing a buffalo. <laughs> chasing a buffalo on the four-wheeler and um, he uh, – he was driving, I was on the back, and um, he, there was two trees, like all these saplings, and he was fanging through it, and he thought, yeah, no worries, we'll get through here with a bloody bike, but um, little did he know, I had my bloody bow sitting across my lap, <laughs> like both limbs caught both ends of the trees, took me off the bike, unstrung my bow, <laughs> broke, broke my thumb, and... Um, Fucking arrows and shit went everywhere. And oh, Randy, yeah. oh, you, you're right, you're right. And I was like, oh, I was just like, I broke my thumb. And he's like, oh, no, you're right. And, you know, me bow, the old Black Widow, she was in, had string, was bloody 20 feet away. There was arrows everywhere. And 
But yeah, it was good. Just bloody twisted the string, uh, the, yeah, the string up a couple of times, swung the bow between your legs, put the arrow, uh, the string back on, and good he's been good ever since. You know, like never had That's an issue. So with good. Bow. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, some bows have just made different. Like the, those sort of bows. Um, you know, the older bows. It seems to be the bows that were made. You know, mm-hmm. like everything. You know, they don't make them like they used to. Um, yeah. You know, that Black Widow mining spent through the ring, I've taken it everywhere. It's missing half its finish. When it rains, it changes colour. That's how much finish <laughs> I'm missing on it. Um, but still to this day, has never let me down, you know. Just one yeah. of those. Um, you know, same with South Bows. Like, I've got one built out of Red Gun here from home, sent it mm-hmm. overseas, and South built that for me. And That's sick. <laughs> we're in the territory. Uh, Randy and I, see, you know, this is Randy's the problem. <laughs> and, uh, we're walking through this grass that was way too tall and fucking the amount of crocs that we were you know probably footsteps from was unbelievable um now that we look back on it, it was stupid anyway <laughs> get through this grass because it was so tall and i was we were rooted like it was hot and we'd been going for a while <laughs> so I'd, I'd get me stalker and i'd reef on it and i'd boomerang it as far as i could with all the arrows in it, straight over the grass as far as I could. And I'd fight my way through the grass, through the water, you know, thinking if I find a crop now, shag, get over to the bow, <laughs> you know, make some arrows in it, give it another toss, throw it as far as I could. And, um, yeah, it's missing missing finish everywhere, but it's the same thing, never let me down. Um, That's hilarious. So you really don't need to change when you get two bows like that. Would, would you ever restore the bow, like put an extra finish on it or anything like that, or you just think it's not worth it? Oh yeah, like you, that most bow companies now do offer that. Um, South certainly does. Like if you, if she's all banged up and that, like mm-hmm. um, you just send it back and he'll it'll come back brand new. You know, just rip, finish off. You know, do yeah, that. Okay. But it's just characters like bloody battle scars. You know, you can Definitely. say, well, this year was from that day. You know, Randy ran over the bow, or um, <laughs> you know, just it's the time he knocked me off a bike. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she was a wild week that one. Um, but no, uh, it's. If you can get old a good bow, like um, the old Mark Kimber the Huntsman bows, probably yep. the most sought after bow in the world, I'd reckon. Um, and people would pay bloody ridiculous money to get one of them because they were just built well. They were just good bows. Yeah, well. um, yeah. If you ever find one for sale, even if you don't use one, just buy it and sell it for double. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what does, like, I think it's kind of around the two, two and a half mark for a decent, like a pretty decent bow. Um, is that correct, or you can go anywhere upwards from there as well? Oh, um, yeah, mate, uh, that's about the average. Um, black tail recurves in America can get up to 13, 14 grand US. Oh, Jesus. Um, yep. even more, but yeah, you just got to Google black tail recurves and you'll see why they, um, they're next level. Like it's, um, they engrave all the risers and they inlay gold and silver. It's just beyond like it would be so good. Um, that you wouldn't even be able to use it. I think yeah, yeah. Dan Taroxy, you've got a couple of them down near Aubrey there. Um, but about two, about two grand is about what you'll get a custom bow for. Okay. Um, then you obviously got to add accessories like mm-hmm. a good quiver. You know, there are a few hundred bucks. Um, that's better. We need that. Just a good quiver. Yeah. And then arrows and that sort of stuff, which is sort of pretty similar to what you guys use. But um, yeah, once you get the good bow, good sort of quiver set up, um, you pretty much laugh and you don't need ARS, you just need a bit of Velcro. Just keep stuff that on that where it wears off. And yeah, and yeah get a half do this in string, you know, Definitely. something like that. Um, and then what's your thoughts on the arrow side of things? Uh, I know you've got the, you your how's that work with Bowhunter's Domain? You've pretty much just off, the offshoot, right? And helping him to move around the traditional bows or traditional arrows a bit more, is that right? They're like yeah, finish on the carbon arrow, aren't they? Essentially, yeah, mate. So <clears throat> back on the territory trip, I was leaving and I was having issues with arrows. And, you know, I'd never shot Shane's arrows before. Mm-hmm. And I rang him and said, mate, I need arrows. Um, I've heard yours are good. Can I get some? I was like, he's like, yeah, no arrows. I said, I want 250 spines. I'm shooting 70 plus pound pre-curve, shooting buffalo. Yeah, no arrows. And um, <clears throat> it was quarter to five on a Friday. And he said, no arrows. I run to the post office. I was like, what bloke in his right mind would run to the post office at quarter to five on a Friday? You know, you'd be more or less running the pub and just a couple of beers. Like, so that was that was tick number one for me. Um, 
he express post them and he yep. got it they were here Monday, which is I can't even get shit from my local town 70 Ks away that quick. <laughs> um, so that was tick number two. And tick number three, I cut the arrow to where I thought it was, and it was a perfect bear shark first shot at 30 yards. Mm. At, um, I was like, you know, these arrows end up shooting a buffalo with them and use them ever since, can't fault them. Then I was talking to Shane, I was like, can we get a trad arrow? You know, I like arrows so much. It was everyone that shot bowing is the main um, level. You know, yeah. Shane matches every set. And that's one thing a lot of arrow companies don't do. He matches ways every set. So every set you get is as close to one another as possible. Mm-hmm. And um, he's like, yeah, yeah, no worries. We sort of talked about it on and off a bit. Then he's like, yeah, no worries. And got a sample sent over. We used it. I was like, these are shit. I sent them to a couple of boys. So I think he might have got six dozen. Yeah. I kept a couple. Sent a dozen to um, Ash Brown, Adrenaline Online, um, mm-hmm. and some to Benny Johnson. Like, we're the three blokes using them. And they were shit. So it was, there was no point. We wanted to try to look an arrow. Yeah. But there was no point going and um, – redesigning and rebuilding a whole new arrow when this arrow was perfect. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There was no need for a traditional bow hunter to improve on that arrow. It's got good weight. Adding mm-hmm. the rat adds a tiny bit of weight. Yeah. Tiny bit of thickness. Um looks cool. Um, the components of it, for example, uh, you can get like 55 grain alloy half cert, out cert with the collar. Mm-hmm. And you're working pretty hard to bend that. If you bend that, yeah. you've either hit something you shouldn't be hitting. Um, then you've got the options of the stainless steel, you know, which bumps your weight up and strength and that. But <clears throat> I said to Shane, we get some trados, you know, I always got a sample set over. We used them. I said, these are shit. I get some more. Mm-hmm. Then um, he basically said, um, he said, I don't want to deal with the trad side of things. I'm not, I don't know enough about it. I don't have yeah. the contacts. I don't know, you know, <clears throat> how about you just do it all? And um, yeah, we'll go from there. So that's how it sort of worked out. So it's been, yeah, cool. it was a great opportunity from Shane. So I'm very appreciative for that. But definitely, um, we we're able to get an arrow shaft in Australia that was designed, or well, not designed, but it's, the looks are designed for traditional bow and it's just have that feel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, definitely. Look, shit up. They're as tough as nails. Good components. Like a lot of arrow companies, you buy the shaft for just 170 bucks. Then you've got to go and buy the components as well. You know, mm-hmm. your price goes through the roof. Whereas these come with the components, um, everything you need. And I don't know. I think Ash Brown, like he's shooting anywhere between two hundred and fifty pigs a year with those arrows. Holy heck! Out of his stick bow, um, he shot everything with them. Um, we were, yeah, we we're just up up north only what week ago when you when you messaged me. I was yeah, going to say you quick, should. Yeah. You should have been there because all of us were in camp and there would have been unreal bloody potty. But um, <laughs> but we shot 80 pigs for three days. You said 80? Was, uh, 80, yeah. Oh, how many of you? Uh, we started off with four, then the fifth bloke came in for the last day. Um, yeah, so for three and a half days. That's and, insane. Uh, all using the same arrows. So all using those arrows, um, all using Coyote Broadheads. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, you just can't fault that set. And that's when it goes back to asking someone that you know hunts a lot. You know, mm-hmm. ask for yeah. If he shoot two hundred and fifty pigs a year, you know, you know what's he using? Why is he using it? And you know, um, he and I use basically the same arrow. He's got a bit longer jaw than me, mm-hmm. but those BHD trad shafts and one hundred and fifty grain Koyuga old school, and that is just flawless. Like as a traditional bow hunter, they're a light arrow. Like we were only running five hundred and 25 grains. Yeah. Um, you literally don't need any other arrow for anything. That's um, unreal. You'd be, you'd be no worry shooting buffalo on that. <clears throat> With the way those are sort of designed. Um, mm. Yeah, like, yeah, Ash is an unbelievable shot. You know, you credit to him the way he hunts and how he does everything. But um, this big pig there the other day um, just walked past and he can just rip, rip his – he's unbelievable. Like, he's a freak. He rip his bow back and just holds on him. Like, he's shooting – Probably 70, 73 pounds. And oh, yeah. he's not a huge, big muscle though. He's a fit as fuck, fella. But so he's ripped his bow back and he's just holding on it, holding on it. Then just, and he just pinpoints and like a big hog and he's blowing arrows clean through him. Just like past through, past through. That's you insane. Mm. So you got to ask yourself, like a lot of people go, oh, you know, 
need 600 grains for this and 750 grains for this, but mm-hmm. you, know, you, got a, you got a bloke shooting 525 grain arrows through pigs and big pigs at that. Mm. You know, you, you'd be asking questions, wouldn't you? Like, how are you doing that? What gear are you using? What yeah. bow are you? You know. Yeah, it's interesting. I actually, um, my cousin came down from Springshaw the other day and got set up with the bow. I helped him kind of get teed up with Summers to make it all happen. And when we were there, Summers is like, um, you should get the BSD shafts. And I was like, yeah, go for it. Like they're the ones I use. I love them. <clears throat> and he then also goes, look, I, I'm not meant to recommend them because I'm a gold tip guy. But at the same time, we never. He's like, I never have any problems with them whatsoever. He's like, yep. yeah, the, the, the shaft I recommend to everyone who doesn't have the money to go and spend on gold tip um because i've just never had any issues with them but um the other side to that is that he's just going to be hunting pigs so i'm like mate just do this setup you'll be great and i told i showed him a few pictures of mine of the pigs that i've got to, with that setup essentially and one thing that summers is like summers talked me into going a little bit lighter because i'm about 585 grains right now um yeah. and he's like mate you can do a few things to make it lighter but I've got too many arrows done up. So I'm busting through, <laughs> trying to bust through my, my two dozen arrows before I do anything, but then just not, they're just not breaking. <laughs> so it's kind of, it's my setup for a long time, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the summer is actually the man. Like, hey, um, I was listening to a podcast. What are the podcasts? Do you, what are they on with you? I reckon mm. um, it was about on tuning or something like that. And I remember him saying that a lot of arrow is like, it's, it's more forgiving, more forgiving. You know, yeah. as in accuracy. And I, I never really thought about it like that. Then, um, sort of put that into play after that, and I was having like huge success on critters because so I run four fetch now, um, yeah, over the last probably five years because uh, we're at a lot of pig hunting, just hunting in general, it's all around, around bushes and you know, shrubs and shit. So, <clears throat> I've got to try and avoid deflection of some sort. So, I went to four fetch, summers is you know, recommendation and yeah. a lot of arrow. And I think with traditional bow, one of, the, one of the biggest problems a lot of people have, regardless of what gear you're using, is how long that arrow takes to get to the pig after the shot, mm. right? Brad Smith will say 80% of pigs will jump a string, right? You may not notice it, but yeah. if you've ever seen a big pig all cut it up from his shoulder down to his ass, you know, rock solid, if you shoot and he hears your bow and he tenses, you know, and your arrow takes too long to get to him and he's tensed up and he's already moving, you know, the muscle fibres and, you know, exactly. his pad and everything is just shifting, so yeah. on the impact, your arrow is going to be, you know, there's shit going everywhere in there. So mm-hmm. um, my theory was the faster I can get an arrow to that critter before he knows, you know, something's wrong, Coming, the better. Yeah. And, um, like, yeah, bows too. Like, everyone be like, oh, yeah, you know, your bows will be too loud. But, like, we're, we've been able to tune our bows now where they're quiet. They're as quiet as um, someone shooting, you know, 800 grains. But, yeah, yeah arrows can get a pig faster um more accurate mm-hmm. and with better arrow flight because just seems a lot of arrow will correct better than a um heavy arrow and mm-hmm. we don't sort of dive into huge foc and no. all that shit. um a nice well, my theory is a nice evenly weighted shaft um, yeah so everyone goes on about oh but foc pulls the arrow into and i was like well that's probably right like you can either put it this way you can throw a ball and chain you know, at something, and the back end is going to be, you know, wiggling around and carrying on, or you can throw a steel peg. Yeah. Which one would you probably be hit with? Yeah, probably the ball and chain, because the steel pegs are going to carry momentum from the whole side of the finish of the arrow and punch through. <laughs> I was up with with Benny Fenson, and um, this is the trip before, and we <laughs> shot about 30, 40 pigs um, for a few days up there, and there was this big pig that I shot, and I shot him front on at probably seven meters. Mm. Um, and it went in between, so basically quarter and on more so. So just inside that front leg, tucked in there beautifully, and it zipped clean through and you know, out the outside of him. And that pig yep. was probably 150 kilos and cut oh, it up wow. from cut it up from arsehole breakfast. And he had, you know, a good two inches pad. Um you know, unbelievable pig, but I, that's where the four fetch for me helps. Like if you mm-hmm. have a shit release where you get excited or, you know, it doesn't come off sweet, that four fetch will just help enough a little bit, won't help, hey, but it'll just help enough sometimes just to correct that arrow in such a short distance Yeah, and uh, help with penetration and that sort of stuff because 
Trisha Barney is a it's a game of their close on AFR. Definitely, you know? definitely. So um, what are your what are your flexions? The Which flexions? Uh, just you like feathers. Yeah. Yeah, just gateway feathers, mate. Um, just just the four fletch, so four fletch, so four inch, um, four fletch, just the parabolics, so the ones that are rounded off backs. Yeah, okay, um, cool. The ones that have got the tip on or the shield cut, they call. Um, yeah. You know, where it's got to be, yeah, they whistle in the mm-hmm. wind. So if you've ever um, shot an arrow or had someone shoot an arrow past you with the shield cut, they'll actually they'll whistle on the way to a critter. Yeah, um, wow. So it's interesting if you're ever in camp and you bought shit, let's get stand by a tree and get someone to shoot the arrow past you. And then the different noises they make is incredible. So <laughs> I've got the four fletch, um, four inch parabolics, gateway, because gateway feathers are the only feather that I've used that you can shoot them through a critter over and over and over again and they just keep keep shooting. Like they just are uh, mm-hmm. as durable as hell. Yeah. Um, some other brands have used, yeah, by the time you've shot them through one critter, it lost half the feather or the quill comes off or the quill's too thin. Um, whereas Gateway's got quite a thick quill. Which doesn't really matter for arrow clearance or contact or anything like that, but it certainly does help when you're constantly punching arrows through things. Like if you're just shooting one animal a year, yeah, you can go and buy the most beautiful set of arrows, beautiful feathers, um, and all going well. If you go mm-hmm. pig shooting with us, for example, you know, you go through 80 pigs in a few days, you only go through some arrows and some feathers and shit. So, yeah. Um, yeah, gateway. They just yeah. That's all the other boys use now too, because they just they just they're durable. They're as durable as hell. Yeah, know? that's awesome. Yeah, I think those those little anecdotal uh, evidences are just so valuable, right? Like it's it's like I don't know. I've always been one for referrals. It just works so much better, right? If you if you've seen great success from it, there's a fair chance most other people are going to see same or similar sort of results. Um, but also just cool to see that you've kind of played around with the arrow so much and been able to fine tune it to what actually does really work for you. Like the zip through a pig, like oh, a 50 kilo mate. pig, man, that's insane. Oh, mate, I'm, I never used to get into tuning arrows and that, and I just thought, arts oh, waste time. Just got an arrow and shot it. And um, unbeknownst to a lot of people, if you have a shit arrow that's flying crap, you know, shooting two foot to the left, mm. if you shoot that arrow enough, your brain will... will work out where that arrow is going to go and you'll shoot that as accurate as hell because you you know your body's adapted to where that shit arrow is flying you know so you'll get in camp all the times and people will be like no nah, the arrow is good the arrow is good you know because if we got a few people every now and again they come and they shoot and they're like i was like how's your arrow shooting mate he's like you know fucking spot on that's just you know good and you sit over their shoulder and watch them and their arrows are flopping and kicking and <laughs> Kick it off and side yeah. you're just like you automatically know, like, I'm a shocker for it. In camp, if someone leaves their bow behind, you know, we're not looking, I'll go and pull an arrow out and I'll see how sharp their broadhead is because if their broadhead's not sharp, I'll give them a kick in the ass. You know, <laughs> look at the arrow spawn and he goes, well, mate, you're shooting a 60 pound bow and then you got a 400 spawn arrow. And we know this isn't going to work, but if you tell me it's going to work, I'll, I'll trust you. 99% of the time, they're wrong. Anyway, so I didn't want to get into tuning because I thought it was one of those things that if I got into, I was going, it was going to be head fucked. I'm yeah. saying so about tuning now that when I'm on the toilet, I make sure the dunny roll spins right. <laughs> make sure it's tuned correctly, you know. And I make sure it's spinning neatly. And um, <laughs> I'll sit there and you know, tune it while I'm sitting there and just like, right, yeah, now she's right now. And um, yeah, dive into a huge rabbit hole and tuning arrows and how to get the best out of your arrow, especially yeah. to stick down to shelf contact, um, you know, like left and right, she knocks, you know, spines, everything, what happens to an arrow when you add weight to the front, to the back, your feathers, you know, and that is a section in today's bowing that is absolutely just non-existent. Everything's up for compounds, but tuning side of things for stick bows just doesn't exist um, because there is a lot more to it than, you know, we were at the, um, <clears throat> the meet and greet, and um, the Northeast Experience one. And, yeah, yeah. Um, Joey, one of Benny's mates, he's ripping fella. He, he come up to me and we've been shooting. We shot the course together and um, he ripping shot. And he comes up to me and goes, Spinksy, I've spent fucking two weeks trying to sort this string out. My arrow keeps kicking high. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, I just can't turn it. I'm going up with me knock, down with me knock. It just, it just keeps bloody kicking up and down. I cannot solve it. And uh, I just looked at it and it took me two seconds because I started laughing because I knew what was wrong. I was like, mate, have you got two knocking points on? He's like, no. Nah. So what do I need two for? I said, trust me, put two on. So I tied one on for him. 
I, I let him go and I said to the boys, we'll be back in about three minutes. And anyway, he comes <laughs> back, he's like, fuck me, dead. That took me bloody two weeks of my life. I'm never going to get back. <laughs> you know, little things like that because especially if you shoot three under, which a lot of people do now, is if you look at the angle of your string on the arrow right, mm-hmm. and where your, your fingers are, the second you release, the angle of the string is acute enough that the arrow will actually slide down the string. Well, the mm-hmm. knock will slide down the string. It may only be a quarter of an inch, could be half an inch, depending on how loose knock, how loose your knock fit is. Yeah. To a point where your, your bottom end catches up, then it'll grip. Yeah. So essentially, you think just with one knocking point that you're shooting spot on, but on release, you could actually be shooting, you know, anywhere between half inch to an inch low with your knocking point because your arrow grips wow. the arrow. Yeah. yeah, you know things like that. Um, you know, like shelf contact, for example. So I'm massive on shelf contact. Everyone looks at their bows, um, so that whatever shelf material is, mm-hmm. I don't give a shit you are. You should never have any wear on your shelf on your on your stick bow, right? Mm. You're like, oh no, that's just how I do it. Well, no, it's not. It's the reason you're getting contact there is because you either got your knocking points not right, your knocking height, or your spine's wrong, or your configuration with your feathers is wrong. So interesting because um, that was something that happened to my bow. <laughs> bore it straight off and I had to, had to replace the whole yeah. thing. Yeah. So when you're bear sharpening, for example, or you want to tune, you get in tuning and you start tuning, it's like, you know, you can't give it a knock high, knock high, you know, change the spine, change knocking points. That might all be fine. It might just be you're getting a tiny bit of a kick off your shelf, right? Mm. So that's just causing your, your knock high. Yeah. Um, a lot of people shoot, this is controversial as shit. Everyone shoots cock feather out. Right, everyone's always said that. I said cock feathers, cock's always better in, right? So, with three fletch, four fletch, whatever you do, if you actually put your cock feather in and you slow mo an arrow coming off the shelf, the way it hits Archer's paradox and bends, it'll clear that shelf a hundred percent, and you won't get any contact at all. So, huh. with a good tuned arrow um, and the right sort of spine and everything. Your arrow, once it on release, it'll actually bend off the shelf completely. So it won't even touch the shelf. Wow. It'll the arrow will be sitting on the outside of the shelf, about where your your knuckle is on your pointer. Um, That's crazy. So the only time an arrow will well, most of the time an arrow contacts is that bottom hen feather. When you've got mm-hmm. cock feather out, the bottom hen feather <laughs> will hit there. And the quill, and you'll see on people's arrows too, they'll have three feathers or four feathers. And they'll have, you know, majority of them will be pristine. They'll have one rooted one. And I've always said to people, if you've got four car, four tires on a car, and one's always flat, would you work out why, or would you just keep changing? You know, <laughs> so yeah. it's little things like that that not a lot of people don't understand. And there's no avenue on either social media or you know YouTube where people actually break down this tuning side of things with stick bows and you know. Where do you put your silences on a string? You know, um, what your knock fit should be like, your tiller. Um, you know, all bows are different. Everyone's body shape's different. You know, not everyone's got the exact same designed arms. You know, mm-hmm. some people got longer forearms, shorter forearms. That affects your draw, that affects your anchor points. You know, it's just a huge um, rabbit hole that we've got to somehow work out how to sort of explain it to people without them going right on board shit listening. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Listen, listen this rabbling. Apart from apart from like tinkering, is there kind of any way around it? Do you reckon, like for each individual? Um, yeah, obviously, going if you to- find a bow tuner, essentially someone like yourself that can fix it properly. Yeah, yeah. yeah go and spend time in camp with someone. Um, so <clears throat> Ash Brown and I, we're going to um, start doing a few courses as well as some guiding. Sick. Um, yeah. Just for us on some pigs and that sort of stuff. And we want to, um, you know, people come in, but we spend a day, like a day's course or a couple of days course on, you know, stick bows, not so much the the form and the shooting side of things, but it's making sure you've got the right gear. Um, you know, are you overbowed, are you underbowed, have you got the right arrows, et cetera, et cetera. And, mm-hmm. you know, so when people leave, they can go, oh, shit, you know, I didn't know that, you know, or, you know, I've had this problem for so long, I just didn't know what it was. And um, 90 Ninety probably percent of people have problems they don't even know about. You know, Definitely. like they just, you know, people will shoot. I saw one bloke in camp, a ripping fella, um, near died on us that night. Though. Um, 
he he was shooting the unreal shot, unreal shot out to about sixteen meters. And I stuck the arrow out at third. Uh, sorry, the target out at thirty meters. And I said, right, I have a crack at that. And he said, I can't. I said, well, what do you mean you can't? He said, my arrow don't go that far. I'm like, what do you mean that? He said, oh, they just they drop short every time, and they just can't shoot that far. I was like, right, uh, we got some issues here somewhere, obviously. Yeah. Anyway, his knocking point was about two and a half inches too high. Right. Anyway, um, then yeah, long story short, he fell into a coma in camp and um, near died on us. So that wow. was a <laughs> interesting night in camp. But yeah, wow. Um, he's all right now. He's coming back up next. Time. Jesus, um, that's crazy. Yeah, it was a bit of a mad day. Were you in the middle yeah, of nowhere was, as well? Um, oh yeah, man. We just got the camp. Um, cracked a few beers, talking. And I oh, may have been wanting to come up for a while. And we're sitting in camp and they're like, right, let's go hunt, let's go hunt. No, nah, just just sit down, have a beer. We'll have a look around, you know, shoot some bows, just get in it, you know, just chill out, yeah, shoot man. some bows, iron out any wrinkles. You know, sitting there and I said, it was getting to that time and all the goal now. I was like, if we just sit here, boys, you know, we'll see you goats from camp. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, I don't know. It's the next moment. Like, I knew where the goats would be because I basically lived out in that block and I said, there's a mob there and so he's run to his run to his car, got his camo on, and um, so let's go. So they'll just hold up my shoe, right? Wind's going that way, they'll speak. Sure enough, they speak. Sat down and he's like took his shirt off. He's getting hot and we're having a few beers, sort of catch up with the boys. And um, he's like, I'm hot. I was like, Yeah, no, you're right. He said, I just can't cool down. I was like, Yeah, right, I know, I should be right. Here, have a have a water. And so we're feeding him waters and gatorades, and he's like, I'm just gonna lay down your swag. I was like, Yeah, right. And um, brain started ticking then. And we checked up. He said, nah, I'm a bit hot. So he goes and gets in his car, turns his car, and he's got the aircon going flat out. I was like, you're right, mate? Yeah, yeah, I'm right. Anyway, then he pops up about 20 minutes later. said, I'm going to go back into town. You know, town 50 k's away. Yeah. So he said, I'm going to go back into town and get a motel. I'm, I'm cooking, can't cool down. He said, I couldn't hold water down. And I'm like, fuck. Righto. And... Um, he started heading out. I said, hold on, mate. There's a bit of a tricky track to get out of camp. Last thing probably only needs, you know, is you lost and, you know, me come looking for you. And I said, right. So I headed out and um, my girlfriend, she's a, like the medical side of things for our footy teams and that sort of stuff. And I rang her. I said, listen, I'm not too sure about this. Oh, mate, he, he's you know, all the symptoms, that sort of stuff. <laughs> and um, she said, you fucking idiot. He's having a heart attack. I was like. Well, that's what I thought it was, and I'm glad someone else sort of you know, um, brought that up. Anyway, he was following me in the in the car behind me, and I looked in my vision, he was gone. I was like, oh, shit, Jesus. here we go. And um, I got out of the car, and he was coming, but he was coming at about bloody two kilometres an hour, like in, the, in his car. So I said, right, the missus said, right, get him in town. So I sort of ran over his car, ripped him open. He's drenched in sweat. He's as pale as shit. I said, mate, we're going to go. He had an heart attack. Then he goes, I've had two before. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> I didn't know this. And he's like, no, no. Oh, come on, mate. Anyway, so right up now, I threw him in the ute. So I grabbed your wallet, grab, leave your car there. You know, just grab whatever you need for um, your medical side of things. You, you know, well, I don't have met him that day, too, mind you. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, Anyway, so we um, so we fanged into here, you know. Anyway, get about fifteen k's from um from camp, and he's in the passenger seat. You're right, mate. He's like, yeah, yeah, no, I'm good. He's good. And anyway, then I look over again, and he's just as still as fuck. I'm like, oh he's God. dead. He's dead as. I'm like, <laughs> look over, and I'm like, oh, I'd had a couple of beers, so that helped a lot. But I'm fanging in town. I look over, like he's dead. And um, so I'm whacking him and whacking him, no response. I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah. I'm like, oh, shit, here we go. And, uh, the old man's the BT-50. She's bloody red line. I'm just scooping <laughs> down. If there's anything on the road, they were in trouble because I couldn't stop. And uh, then he sort of wakes up again. And I was like, oh, you're right, mate. You no idea where he is. And, um, you know, keep going. And I'm whacking him again. And then turn around again. And he's like dead still, leans his head back and like lets out like a real slow breath. And I'm like, oh, he's dead this time. You know, he's dead. <laughs> you know, I'm nearly in town. There's no point in me bloody, you know, pulling over and trying to pump him on the side of the road here because, you know, no one's going to come to me. I'm, I'm only about bloody 10 k's away, but only about a minute and a half from town. Yeah. And um, scooted through town, 
and through the lights over the bloody garden at the hospital in the U. Um, yeah, into the bloody emergency, they dragged him out and um, took him into the room. And I'm sitting outside, they're like, you know, who's your friend? I said, oh, such and such. How old is he? I said, I don't know. I was like, yeah. Where's he from? I said, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I was like, mate, I met him today. You know, don't give me a hard time about this. I met him today. <laughs> anyway, um, got him in on the on the bed there and the doctors got called in and then the lights and the sirens and shit were going off and, um, you know, he just kept falling in and out of consciousness and that. And I remember the doctor, he was squeezing him around the neck and he was whacking him. And all I could think was, fuck, he's going to be sore tomorrow if he's alive. You know, like he was... <laughs> Good bass and bruise, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, I was I went and, you know, said, oh, this is such and such. I think this, I found his wife's phone number on his phone and that. And, and then, yeah, then the signs went off and he's obviously bloody... When something was happening, the doctor said, you know, get me out. You know, thinking that this bloke's going to die. You know, don't want me soon. So I'm in the next room playing on my phone. Um. You know, I just adrenaline was like going through me, like you can imagine. Uh, anyway, then they um they wanted to airlift old mate, and um he yeah he was too unstable, so they took him by ambulance and got him up to Mildura there, and he was right. And um, <laughs> I showed him back at the care. I remember the boys, you know, they still have a couple of years. How'd you go? How's old mate? I said, well, he's not coming back with us. And they're like, what do you mean? I said, oh, he's you know he's in trouble. He's you know he's he near dead. And uh, they're just like shit. Like they were just like gobsmacked, and like the whole camp went silent. And um, then he got a phone call the next day, and he was all right. And um, oh. I caught up with him, and um, I said, "How are you feeling, buddy?" He said, "Yeah, right." And I was like, "How's your neck and your shoulder?" He's like, "Fuck, I'm sore. Why am I so sore?" And I said, "Oh my god, he was clogging the Christ out here." And um, it was really good because I said, "All right, come back. You know, redeem yourself. You know, you need to die. I mean, you can't do that again." He never shot a big, you know, anything, you know, never shot anything bigger than a cat or a rabbit. So he came up home again, took him out. And um, he was much fitter too. Like he looked after himself a bit better and he shot a couple of animals and shot his first goat. And, you know, it was bloody, it was unreal, like a huge, big story. Yeah, yeah. It's coming back around. to where it was. And, um, yeah, but, yeah, it all ended up just from, it was good actually because we sat in the camp and sort of screwed around with the bows and we shot and looked at tune. If we'd gone... Oh shit! If we'd started walking, he would have died. He would have been dead. Yeah, exactly. Like, That's insane. Because we would have, we would have been too far. The doctor said if we hadn't have taken him when he when we did, he was dead. Um, hmm. if, if I had let him drive out, if yeah, if my brain, because I was thinking in the back of my mind, my girlfriend began. If you let him drive off by himself, you're a dickhead. So I was like, yeah. I don't know. I don't, I'll, I'll follow him out. If, we, if we'd let him drive off, we would have found him the next morning. He's yeah, exactly. Up. Yeah. You know, only probably five hundred meters from camp. Yeah. And. Uh, yeah, it was bloody. It was a mad experience. Like it was, adrenaline was unreal. But yeah, just goes to show that sometimes you just gotta <laughs> be yeah. a little bit more aware of your surroundings, I suppose. Definitely, and it's funny. Like even just as something as simple as like carrying a first aid kit with you. Like I've always got one in my car, yeah. but often I forget about it. I, I used to put it in my pack all the time, but it often just gets left in the car now. I'm like, well, if we get bit by a snake, it's not going to do much good in the car, is it? But at the same time. Nah. It's like, you just hope it never happens. No, but, I, think, yeah. I think we all get a bit complacent every now and again. Um, mm. You know, like Randy and I, we, we got into a situation up the territory that, you know, no bandage would have fixed that if she went, you know, if she went south with yeah. a crocodile. Um, but, yeah, I think it's like most things, everyone gets a bit caught up with, you know, the excitement of things and we don't really think too much sometimes. And um, Definitely. you got to take a step back and realise, you know, like we were very, very lucky with our mate. Like, yeah, if we'd started walking off and got, you know, K okay from camp, you know, very good chance he wouldn't have made it back to camp. And um, by the time we'd bring someone to get out there, you know, he would have been cactus. Um, yeah. But yeah, just having a look, like when when he couldn't hold water down, that's when my brain started going bang. It's like, right, oh, something was wrong here. Yeah. Um, they scrans us to the ute for aspirin, you know, always handy to have aspirin on hand um, for heart attacks and that sort of stuff. But, uh, it turns it like he was a diabetic too. Um, so he had low blood sugar and yeah, just mm. she was a world of bloody issues at the time. All but things going, yeah. I said, when you come back, you better come back, make sure you're fit, <laughs> stay off. Um, you know, and he came back about 25 kilos lighter, you know, fit that's healthy. awesome, yeah. And um, he's smiling his face, mate. We um got out the back, 
and he just missed, I think, three goats just because he was just excited. Like, he just adrenaline, he was excited. <laughs> and me looking over his shoulder with camera, so he had pressure on him. And I'd seen this goat running. And he had the open, he had his head up, and he was all rutted up, this Billy, and he was looking for girls, looking for girls. And I was just like, I said to him, I said, hey, he's going to come to us we call. He's like, yeah, right. <laughs> so I've called this goat, and on, he turned on a dime, and he just sprinted at us. And I said, he's coming. This is about 400 metres up. So he's sprinting at us. And he, I said, he knows where we are. We'll stop calling. He said, when he walks around this bush, draw back. And um, old mate drew back on him. I was like, sure. <laughs> and he froze. Like, he froze. <laughs> And you know, then something must have happened, and this the goat ran. Uh, he was at probably four meters when you first seen him. Yeah. Then he ran sixteen. And I pulled him up with the bleat, and old mate pinwheeled him. Goat ran twenty meters and cactus. Old mate was near in tears, like it was. That's it was crazy. one of the best best moments ever. Um, yeah. I don't forget. That. Like it was one of those situations where we'd gone from could have been such a shit show to start with to you know this big grand house to. And getting his first kill, yeah, you know, grin on his face was worth every second of it, you know. I bet, and I think, um, like the cool thing to point out there, you said he'd had two heart attacks before this one, but hadn't changed his life, right? And then all of a sudden, you go out on this bow hunting trip, maybe he's got a little bit of purpose or passion that he's got to put towards bow hunting now, like he's got a he's got something to look forward to. Gone and lost 25 kilos to come on this trip with you, he's made a big effort, and all mm. of a sudden, it's all paid off. Like, I think that's just it's, it's pretty powerful, and I think. Really, that's the side of bow hunting we don't really talk about enough. I try to talk about it a lot because I think there's just such a, a good side to the mental health side of it, but also that just it gives people a good bloody purpose in life, right? Oh, absolutely. Like he he um he'd been drinking too much bloody alcohol. He was mm-hmm. yeah overweight. He'd had a handful of you know heart issues. He had diabetes issues. He had um he just he started rapping off what was wrong with him. I was like. Next time you tell me, yeah, yeah, <laughs> if exactly. You got this, man. Like, if you're allergic to something, you better tell me. Anyway, <laughs> it was a disaster waiting to happen, and mm. it's probably one of the best things that ever happened to him, to be honest. Because, yeah, um, he said, Right, I'm, I'm coming back, I'm gonna be fitter. Um, biggest thing was he was on those man shakes, yeah, yeah, and I reckon that was one of the problems too. Because he, so, when he got there, he was so excited, <laughs> he'd been eating like shit, been drinking yeah. too much. And um, when he's seen that first one go, I reckon his heart just, adrenaline must have just whacked him that hard and his heart rate was going through the roof because he's like, well, there's goats. That's what I'm here for. I've always wanted to come hunting. And I think that's just what started tipping over. And, um, yeah, just goes to show sometimes that having a bit of awareness, I suppose, and a bit of medical history, a bit of sort of medical sense. You Definitely. Know, yeah. It's not right. It usually isn't. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. We actually – um. Funny, it's similar, similar, same, same, but different. We went to a party when I was a bit younger um, and one of my mates greened out. He had too much weed and greened out and um, there was a paramedic there and she came up because he was just completely out to it. It wasn't functioning at all. She comes up with a knuckle just like that and puts it in his sternum and rubs it up and down his sternum real hard, like right in the middle of it and goes, oh, and she's like, ah, he's fine. <laughs> that was it. She was like, yeah, hey, you're right. And that was, like, that was her, her call to it. She's like, ah, he's, he's still somewhat like functioning if, if he was not going to react then we'd know we need to do more i'm like okay <laughs> well trust you <laughs> yeah i'll remember that next time i see someone that's all green yet exactly or next time you made as a hard attack just rubbing my yeah. them real hard <laughs> yeah. hopefully hopefully never again um uh, mate you had a pretty interesting experience recently where you had joel turner in camp um uh, mr mallon yeah, Mr. Paddy Mellon. Um, so a few stories to tell there, obviously. But I think um, just to quickly explain, so he, he's from Shot IQ. He's helped a lot of people with getting over target panic and just understanding the shot process in general. Um, what was he actually out for? Was he out teaching the course or something? Or No, no, he just came out for a hunt. We, um, yeah, awesome. He was – I didn't get down to the hunt. Uh, sorry, I didn't get down to the course and either the dash, but I, I spoke to Benny Ma because he was organising – the whole um, course is that. So I said, listen, I know you're down in Melbourne, you're only four and a half hours from me. If you guys get a break and you want to go for a hunt, just give us a buzz and come up. Yeah. And uh, he said, oh, shit, no, thank you very much. He said, I was, I didn't have anywhere to go and he was going to be here for a week prior. Um, so I said, oh, that's no worries. Just come up. There's plenty of goats, a few pigs. You know, just because I would have thought, well, he's come all the way across the world. Mm-hmm. You know, it'd be nice if someone, you know, gave an opportunity. Well, to go to Definitely. Anyway, I rang Ash. 
because Ash actually, um, he said, oh, it'd be good to go and see this fella. I said, well, he's actually going to be coming up hunting. Do you want to come down? You know, come down for the week. And he's like, ah, bring him up here. Come up here. We'll go shoot some pigs. I said, all right. No worries. So we, we met up with Ash goes and, yeah, she was just nonstop bloody laugh from the start. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I don't know who left um, West for where. I saw what he did. So, um, what the poor prank on each other. Oh, mate. Like, he's just typical American. Like, he, you know, he, he was pretty um, – oh, just funny. It was funny. Like, I think it was better because we weren't paying for a course, so we weren't paying it. We were mm-hmm. just blokes yeah, going yeah. hunt. So we just pulling yeah. the piss out of each other. Yeah. Um, and he caught on real fast. Like he was, <laughs> yeah, he was had the most horrendous, was it the phrase, is it? No, you got me. Yeah. you good. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, he, at, by the end of it, he had the most horrendous mouth. Like he was absolutely <laughs> filthy. Just taking on all the Aussie saying, he's like, how do you say this? And why do you say this? And, and we're just feeding him like as true blue Aussie as you can imagine. Yeah. And, um, yeah, by the end of it, oh, it's it it funny. But um, I thought to myself at the start of the trip, I said, oh, we're gonna, we've got to stitch him up for some reason. Like, he's this huge, high profile bar owner. Um, you know, he's come across the world, do this and that sort of stuff. Let's, let's bring him down to our, our level. It's just like <laughs> having good fun out. Huh? Anyway, we'd seen all these party melons. I said, to Ash, we'll give him to eat one of these. He's like, no, I can't. I said, no, we're right. Anyway, so all week, we're just, we're driving along and like we'd be in the ute and I'd say, Ash, oh, it's a good patty mail on there. And we're like, we weren't talking to Joel, but he was like, kept picking up, like, what do you mean? I'm like, what are they? I said, oh, it's just a melon, you know. Um, they just grow old out of you and that sort of stuff. And um, <clears throat> he said, no, they're really good eating. And anyway, Benny Mar got on it too. He's like, yeah, my grandfather used to live off them. They used to add a bit of sugar to them. And, you know, we, we had it rolling. We had it absolutely unreal. And um, then I like, kept going and we come across a, a heat room and he's like, oh, can I eat one? I said, no, no, you can't eat any of them, mate. You know, you don't want to eat them. He's like, what do you mean? He said, oh, they're not quite right, you know. He said, well, how do you know if they're right or not? I said, well, because they're heat pigs, mate, all the right ones get eaten by the pigs, you know. He says, so they're just not, you know, you've got to find some that are fresh where the pigs haven't been, you know, because they only eat the right ones. Oh, right, no. Anyway, it was about day five or something in our trip and we're looking for a pig um, that one of us shot. And Joel's 100 metres down, down the track. And there's a big tree and we're sitting under it and we're like, oh, the pig's gone, you know. And Ash is like, I'll climb this tree. And when he comes back, I'll jump out of the tree on him. And mind you, Ash is bloody psycho because it was about a 14 foot drop. Anyway, <laughs> so Joel holds him back as he does and um, gets to the tree and just looks straight up. And we're like, fuck, how do you know that? Anyway, he goes, boys, he said, oh, I've hunted, you know, all over the world and I've been in serious situations with my work, you know. I am designed to look for danger in my awareness and, you know, you know, I've got to be alert all the time. But the second he finished saying, they said, oh, look, there's patty melons. <laughs> and um, I was like, oh, I was nearly tears. Like, oh, perfect. And I went over there and we said, oh, we, like, we just knew this was the time. And um, he picked one up and, like, it looked as green as perfect. And I said, no, 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 it's not right. And I kicked a few around and I found one that was sort of half under dirt. And I said, oh, look, it's half under dirt. The pigs haven't found it yet. This one's right. This one's right. Go. Anyway, <laughs> I was throwing it to him. Ash is filming through his bono harness. Benny Mars out the back going, yeah, no, my, yeah, my grandparents, they, they swear by him. And, and I'm, I'd leave. I'm pissing myself laughing because I knew what was coming. I didn't know it, how he didn't see it. It's like he just told us how aware of danger he was. <laughs> anyway, um, his was open. And it's this beautiful colour. And I was like, oh, perfect, mate. Looks like rock melon. And it cuts a big slice out of it. And I'm gritting my teeth, like trying to laugh. Sure enough, takes a big bite out of one. And the second he bites, he looks up at us. And we're just like grin from ear to ear. <laughs> our eyes are watering. <laughs> goes, That's pretty fucking sour, boys. <laughs> and um, we're just in tears. He cried on the ground for a good 20 minutes. And um, it was just, it was the highlight. Then he's. And I said, oh, actually, mate, they are poisonous. If you Google them, they're poisonous to humans and, you know, that sort of stuff. And he's like, bullshit. I said, no, they are. Anyway, Ash and Ben said, are you serious? I said, actually, no, if you look at Google, they're no good. These things are toxic. Fuck. <laughs> and um, for the rest of the trip, for the rest of the trip, Joel's like, um, 
I was like, how are you feeling, mate? You're looking a bit pale. You, you feeling all right? And um, like just, you know, the whole time I said, actually, my me, me tongue feels a bit fuzzy. It feels a bit numb. I said, yeah, no, that's the toxins, mate. Are you feeling all right? So when he felt like he was like real good and shooting well, I was like, you, you feeling all right? And um, so we played that for the next few days and we're in camp and he and Ash shooting up against each other. And um, Joel starts missing, you know. And we're like, mate, it's that daddy melon's kicking in, you know, you're tossing, you to be asleep later. And, you know, threw him off his game, something shocking. But, um, yeah, we had a bloody good fun was just a, doing that. He shot a... A week-long trick, yeah. a week-long prank that came together. That's hilarious. Oh, it was... Oh, I'll never forget that. And, um, yeah, I, I, he had a ball. Like, we got to, you know, we just had just good fun, you know, mm. which was nothing. There was no egos, no... Um, you know, no higher rank than anyone else. It was just no, yeah, awesome. Yeah, um, he um, he sh- I think first day he shot three goats, and I said to him, "I said when you come over, mate, bring lots of arrows." And he's like, "Yeah, right, I know." I was like, "No, nah, bring shit loads of arrows. Where are we going? This you know, game rich. You know, you can shoot all day, you can hunt all day. Bring lots of arrows." Yeah, yeah, right, I know. That gets over here. by about day three. He's down to about three arrows. <laughs> I'm like, mate, I fucking told you to bring more arrows. He's like. Honestly, mate, every time someone's ever said to me, he said, come out for a hunt. Make sure you bring plenty of arrows. You know, you're going to need them. He said, I've never had to use them, you know. And by the end of it, he was going through um, Benny Mars' box, pulling out all different types of arrows and that sort of stuff, trying to make arrows up because he was just going through them like that. He was just sending arrows. He's like, this is so much fun. He said, I've never been able to do this. And he said, the best part of this is everything that I preach, everything that I train people for, I can actually put into practice constantly mm-hmm. and yeah. bush like you can say that right i do this 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 and this and you might get one shot a year in america where if he's like exactly yeah in 30 40 opportunities over a few days and he was just, he just loved it he said that was one of the best trips i've ever been on my life yeah yeah, yeah. i was talking to a mate over in the states just before i went and did this farm sitting a few weeks ago and he's like are you going to get much hunting? And I'm like, oh, I plan on doing like some, hopefully every day and stuff. He's like, what? You can hunt every day? And he's like, what about tags and stuff? I'm like, no, man, we don't have to do any of that. Like you can literally hunt every day in Australia. It's, it's incredible. And he's like, that's absolutely insane. He's like, just send me any footage of you going out hunting. Like just, I want to see some stuff of what you do. And I hunted all of like two to three hours sort of thing. Like it really wasn't much. And he was like, dude, that is incredible. Like just beyond awe because they they literally, they've got like their treat stands they sit in or they've got the 30 days of, of sitting for elk and calling for elk and walking through public land where you don't even know if there's going to be elk. Like he, he was just, yeah, he was blown away by, by it, which is, it oh. kind of, it's just, it's incredible what we do have access to in that perspective. Oh, that's what Joel was like. Like it was about day three and he's into bed. He said, when am I coming back? When can I come back? I need awesome. to come back. He said, um, you know, he, he'd just been over to New Zealand prior. Um, I don't think they had much luck over there. They shot a few critters, but, you know, he came over with us and he, he could have shot 30 critters for the week, you know. Mm. Um, you know it was just like there'd be more pigs. And we'd be like, right, you know, whose turn is it? We'd be like, right, Joel, just go, mate. Like we get to hunt here all the time. We get to do this, you know, yeah, exactly. whenever we want. Yeah. You know, take this opportunity. And, uh, yeah, first couple of goats he shot, he was just cheer. And then, you know, that, that Arvo, he shot another couple. And that night he shot a couple of pigs. And, you know, it was just – he was just in everything that he'd ever dreamed of doing, I think, like from what Americans see of what we do. You yeah. Know? And he's – I've got to go and do that. And uh, yeah. like I'm, he said, I'm coming back. So if you boys will have me, I'm coming back. He said, because this is ridiculous. He's probably yeah, shot in that – he probably shot more animals in those, you know, few days than he would for, you know, it could be 10 years. Oh, exactly. You know? Yeah, at least, it's right? Ridiculous. Like, yeah. I actually, I'm so excited because in July, I'm coming back down to Randy's block in, um, like, it's it's near Tamworth, essentially, so in that Hunter, Hunter region. And I'm just so excited because last year, the amount of critters we saw, like, it's just beyond anything that I see up here in Queensland. It's just, it's literally next level. Like I've seen once, once I've seen about 40 pigs in a, in a block here. Um, but outside of that, like I never seen anything like that. And I saw that every day at his block. I was like, holy shit. Like, it's just, it's just game rich. Like it's crazy. The amount of opportunity you get within a day is just next level. Oh, that, that like, yeah, the place where Andy's got or places you'd say is, it's an unbelievable place. Um, but the only reason it's unbelievable is because the work Randy's done being up there. Like he's a very, very 
probably the most unselfish hunter you'll ever meet. He'll put everyone else before himself. Yeah. Um, I've seen him do it maybe when we first started hunting. Um, like he'll go right up there and pick his bar up, getting you know, spastics like me to try and shoot a deer. And, <laughs> you know, like he's just so kind in that regard. And, but even like with all the groundwork he's done with the property owners, you know, is unbelievable. He was, you know, telling me stories when the drought was on. He and his brother and that, they were, you know, buying hay out of Sydney. You know, and that yeah. over. And that was out of their own pocket, you know. Yeah. Like, I got to the point where they didn't give a shit about the hunt, but this is, you know, it's, you know, help the property owner. And um, through that, we've all been, you know, anyone that's hung up there has appreciated how good it is. 100%. And um, how lucky you should feel, to, you know, even be able to hunt there just due to how much hard work he's done over the years to, you know, get it to what it is. Um, so, yeah, if you ever get an opportunity, like, mate, like I said before, I've been up there for a while. Um, I used to go every rut and a couple times in a year just having that chance to get up there and um, hopefully we can get up there shortly. But, um, yeah, it is a it is a brilliant place. Um, I'm sure there are other places like it. but um, Definitely. I mean, right now in, in New South in general, I think there's – um, we got sent something the other day. It, it was um, – by a guy that's coming on the hunt with us and he was saying that it was like news reports of pig like the, the pig infestation essentially through new south wales in general right now saying how extreme it is like they reckon it's, i don't know how uh, it's been previously. it's been such such a good season the last sort of two years for him like my brother rang me when i was leaving um he's a manager probably up in sort of northwestern new south wales mm -hmm. and uh he rang me when i was yeah, on my way up to go with the boys and he said, mate, I just had the wind put up me. I said, what do you mean? He said, he's on a place where there's plenty of pigs and that. And he said, I was um, fixing floodgate. Um, my dog was barking. So he said, you know, got another pig. Like, heaps of pigs there. You know, so they just got another pig. So he rode down there on his bike. And this is only 800 metres from his house. And um, he said there was his five dogs were in the, in the middle. And there was 100 pigs had the dogs rounded up. Holy had, hell. He had, well, like, these five dogs, they had a pig each. They were swinging. And um, even his little Kelpie that shouldn't have been. But he said there was 100 pigs. And if, I don't know if you've ever seen it. There'd be a lot of blokes that have seen it. But when you shoot another pig and it's injured or a pig smell blood, they'll they over attack it. That, yeah, they'll get up and they'll, like, go, like, <clears throat> like, they'll really get into it and they'll hell stand up and the sows go berserk anyway. Yeah. So, yeah, 100 pigs doing this. And his dog's in the middle, and he said at least 40 of them were pigs over 85, 90 kilos. Like, oh, holy Jesus. And so this is out west, so they're hooky buggers. And um, he said every time um, – so a big boar would come out of the mob, fly and whack a dog, then he'd keep running and go to the other side. Then another pig would take turns, whack that one. And, like, he had to – he couldn't do anything. So he said he rode home, got his straight away, and started pumping. And um, he said it was crazy. He said if, you, if you'd broken a leg, you know – they would have just eaten you alive. Um, yeah, and his sad. wife said, oh, you should have let me know. I would have loved to come film. She does a lot of and He's like, no, nah, that was dangerous. That was no place for anyone to be. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so he's like, no, nah, it was bloody big, you know. Um, but he's on a block where he, like, he came out from work one day. Um, yeah, on his way out from work, and he shot 55 pigs on his oh, way out yeah. from work, like, through his property in the where he works on um because it's the heap of country up there yeah just um, coming home trying to get home we shot 55 pigs and um like the infestation like up there just going through the roof and like even down here um like where i am there's always used to be the mobs of twos and threes and you know six that sort of stuff and you know now you hear the farmer say well there's 50 in that mob wow. yeah there's 100 in that mob you know, they're just they're you know, so well. Like the season's just been so good, which is bloody good for bow hunters, but not good for farmers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's the time to be getting out and getting hunting, that's for sure. <clears throat> um, but yeah, like to hear bloody you know, knocked over eight, 80 plenty of arrows. Yeah, exactly. Plenty of arrows. Make sure of it. I actually might need to get another dozen for this next trip, eh? Um, <laughs> but yeah, like like you said, um, like 80, 80 pigs in three and a half days. Like that's that's at least got to put a smile on the farmer's face. Yeah, well, it didn't even where we were didn't even put a dent in them. He um he went for a drive before we got up there, and um he said, "Oh, I'm going to town. I'm buying eight bulls." And he said, "But I wait until you fellas are out, then we'll go sick." Um, but mind you, like we um <coughs> we hunt 
all day. Yeah. Then we hunt all night. Then we hunt all day. Then we hunt all night. So, so tell me about that all night that, with the bow. Yeah. So we use we have been using um, like thermals and headlamps. Oh, wow. Yep. So um, so we've been doing it for a while now. Um, us group boys, but so it all it all worked out because we're all of us are time poor now. Um, like I've got a daughter. Um, I've got you know a couple of businesses I run. I can't just piss off now for two weeks. No. Um, ben is the same, Ash is the same, you know, all these boys are the same. So we worked out now. So we, by using a thermal, that sort of stuff with the stick bow, we can hunt in three days. We can hunt for six days. Yeah. Six days. Wow. So it's, it's, it's come a way where we can get together, you know, go hunting. Um, but like, for example, I drove nine hours to go hunting with the boys. Um, if you hunted for three days, we, you know, it's a fair way of three days. Yeah, it's good. But we hunted for six days worth, you know. So it sort of makes it a bit easier for us to just like take a Friday off, yeah, uh, get up there Saturday night, come home Sunday, and it honestly it feels like you've been gone for two weeks. Um, so yeah, so with a stick bow, essentially all we're doing, um, hunt all day. We're probably shooting, I'd say, 50 50. Yeah. So 50% during the day, 50% during the night. Um, so what we do, um, yeah, it's no secret. We just use a the thermal. Um, like a monocle? Yeah, just like a thermal. monocle. Yep. Yep. So the boys, um, I don't have one because I'm poor. Uh, the other boys. <laughs> so I just got to rely on them. But yeah, so out in the paddock, or we actually, like, sometimes you don't even use them. You'd be just somewhere and you hear them old pigs fighting. Mm. And um, this is more like out in the stubble or out in the, on the plains where you just normally can't hunt during the day. And you'll just spot them with a the thermal and say, right, eh? Or using light knocks. You need light knocks for your loose arrows. Yeah, and you just walk in, you still got to get your wind right, you still got to be quiet because the the hearing is almost twice yeah, as good at night for some reason. Yeah. Um, and you get into about 50 yards quietly, then you have um, you can either do it by yourself or you get someone to help you, you just get your head lamp, flip it to your side, like on the side of your head, and you just draw back and and you stick on, or you have um, a bloke in front of you with a light, with just with yeah. the head lamp. You're stalking about 50 yards, and when you're about to shoot, you flip the light on, send an arrow, and using the luminox, it makes life easy. You can watch them run around, um, mm. flop over. But, um, yeah, we've been back around doing that for a couple of years. Um, <laughs> bloody good fun. Like with stick bows, it's it's no different to shooting a daylight. It's exactly yeah, that's incredible. You still got to do everything the same. Um, like in your shot process, there's yep, no, yep. um, yeah, it's, it's honestly. Benny and I, we were on a trip for a couple of years ago and we did it and we got like first time we ever did it and we said this was just good fun. Like mm. regardless of what mm-hmm. a lot of people think about it being hunting and, you know, like we still hunting during the day, but, we, you know, we're capitalising on the night time. Um, it was just at the end of the day, it was just unbelievable fun. Just yeah, good definitely. Fun mates. Um, you know, like so you don't sleep. So the first night we got, the last trip, Benny and I, we um, we got up to the joint. We got there at 10.30 that night. We didn't go to bed. We rocked back up to camp at daylight. We shot 18 pigs um, between us. Yeah. Uh, got back from the camp. Walking back to camp, we're, we're shagged. Like, you know, we've been walking across stubble for bloody kilometres. And um, he said, I'm going to bed. And I looked up the sky and it looked bloody unreal for fishing. And I was like, I'm going to fish it. He's like, you're fucking crazy. <laughs> no, look at it. You know, anyway, first cast, the service lawyer, I got a buff, so I was like stoked. But so you go to sleep. Um, Normally what we try and do is so we'll hunt all night and hunt the morning. So I just don't go back to bed. Yeah. Then around lunchtime you have feed, have probably two hours sleep. Then you go out, um, you know, three o'clock, start hunting again. Mm-hmm. Then you hunt all night. So hunt all over, all night, all morning. Yeah. And maybe two hours the following day. Um, so I think this last trip in Tara, we probably had six hours sleep in three and a half days. Yeah, wow. Um just from, we'll just flat out hunt. So mm-hmm. it's a it's a brilliant way to um you see a lot a lot different animals at different times of nights. Um, sometimes you wouldn't see them in the day, like you know, but then we went for one walk. Um, we had one night where it was just, you know, everywhere we looked there was a pig. Okay. And the next night that was one. Then the next morning there's a section that Benny said, No, nah, there's gonna be pigs in here. So this is about midday. We went to the camp up and we walked through, I think Ash shot seven. Hmm. I shot a couple, <clears throat> Mr. Big Fella. The boys shot, I think we might have shot 18 pigs, you know, in about two hours in this one small patch of like this Gouraba, um, 
But the beauty of that was normally, as everyone knows, you get up in the morning, go for hunt, get back at, you know, just say 10 o'clock, especially out west here, and you've got to wait five, six hours and you're exactly. bullshit, doing nothing. Yeah. You know, the other hunt, then you get that one, one or two hours of last light where it's mm-hmm. golden out. You know, then when it's dark, you go out to camp, you sit around camp all night, you know, having a few beers, talking shit, and go to bed early and do it all, do it all again. Whereas, Whip, you know, catch up all the time. Yeah, exactly. Fishing, you know, cooking, have a good feed, then they go hunting, you know, all over, shoot a couple of pigs. Then the second it gets dark, all we got to do is just put your headlamp on, chuck a few layers on. Good to and um, then, then just keep going. Then by the end of the night, I, we worked out the last trip. Like, it was about, it was way too cold. So once it got to about midnight, um, pigs just, they were gone. Like it was just too wow. cold. They were just huddled up. Yeah, it was just freezing. Like it was minus four, I reckon, where we were. Yeah. Um, it was just absolutely freezing. So yeah, then we'd go out to camp and we'd have a feed because we usually put um they put a camp oven on or something like that. Yeah. So we'd go and have a feed and sort of get some gear ready and that sort of stuff. And either have a you know a quick snooze in and get up in the morning and keep going. It, it is hard work, like it's but oh definitely, yep. The beauty of it was that in yeah, capitalizing on your time that's available. Like, you know, yourself, like, you try and get five bonus together all on the yeah. same schedule to yeah. get them into camp to catch up. Like, it's near uh, impossible. Yeah. Whereas now we can say, right, oh boys, we're going to go up. You know, this section is going to be better during the day. This section will be better during the night. Um, you know, do you just want to come for three days? And it's like, normally, just like three days is enough, not worth travel. Yeah. But if you hunt for six days in total, you know, three days. Big difference, up. definitely. Yeah. You get to capitalise on hunting, and um, we last trip was bloody unreal. Benny and I um, previously, we were knackered. We'd shot a few pigs, you know. This is big black and white boar, and um, we stalked in on him. Um, so you don't put the headlamp on until you're pretty close. Mm. You got a bloke that's got a thermal. Other bloke can't see shit. Like he's yeah, just yeah. like blind eyes. <laughs> and I get in. I said, "Right, he's a good boy here." We get in a bit. Oh, 10 yards of him, 10, 15 yards. And he's walking towards us. So we had to squat down. And um, he's just coming and coming. And I'm like, I said, Benny, he's coming. You're going to have to shoot him down the front or we're going to get trampled. He's like, no, no, no. I won't shoot him down there. I won't until he turns. He's like, no, nah, shoot him down through the neck, like down the side of the neck. And he's just, no, no, not doing it, not doing it. So, right. We're on hands and knees. And anyway, I, I looked up and I didn't even need the thermal. I was like, I can see the bastard. He's like, Five yards away, you got to shoot him. <laughs> and anyway, he's like, No, nah, no, nah, not doing it. I'm going to wait until he turns. And anyway, I turned to him and I said, Shoot the fucking thing the other neck. Well, we're going to get chased here in a second. Flick the line on, Benny drew back, sunk it down the side of his neck, got full pen out, and his pig blew out and he comes straight between us. Oh, like, literally Jesus. just blew. Straight between, <laughs> and you could just see the light had not been the outside of his neck. Oh, wow. He, he ran 20, 30 yards and tumbled over. And we're bloody pissing ourselves, laughing, <laughs> feeling, carrying on. And um, yeah, I just had like some of the best fun doing it. Like, if you've got a mate that's got a thermal, like those things are unbelievable. Um, yeah, definitely. You know, just get out for a night. Like, the best part about it, too, like, if you work all day and you want to go hunting, you know, mm-hmm. and it's, it's dark, you just grab that and go for a walk. Um, I don't know if you see the foxes up, shoot them. Yeah, definitely. Like, I got a cat just a few weeks ago because of the, the night hunting, essentially. Like, someone showed me how to put, how to position the, um, torch properly on my bow so i could actually see and it was great i, I shot a pig i shot a um a cat and it really it was the only reason i was able to hunt when i went on this last little farm sitting experience otherwise i wasn't going to get much hunting in at all i had a, a few one hour morning walks if even and then pretty much didn't really come across much and then they had grain they had they feed them the cattle grain and these pigs were coming in every night to the grain and someone's like mate why don't you get down there and shoot oh, with your man. bow I'm like, well, I'm not going to be able to do it. Like, I just can't figure out the the lighting setup. And he's like, do this. And so I did it. And it was just, it was incredible. Like, it, it gave me that experience, which is awesome. Oh, absolutely. So, and like, the best part about having a property with a heap of pigs, um, well, sorry, the worst part is the property owner's going to go, well, we've got heaps of pigs, we've got to get rid of them. You know, so if you go in there and go, right, I, I almost got, you know, 5,000 pigs on his place, he needs to go and you go in there and you shoot six, you know. And because you, you know, hunted during the day and, you know, waited for the right opportunity. Um, sorry, not, not waited for the right opportunity, but waited for the right animal sort of thing. Yeah. Whereas if we can go right up, we've come in with the boats. Um, you know, didn't 
discriminate, you know, what pigs we were there to do a job, yeah. essentially. Like, if we want to come back here, we've got to shoot pigs. We've got to shoot, mm-hmm. you know, plenty of them. So it was just, it was overseas on everything. So when we go back, um, you know, running the property out of the way, he's like, how'd you boys go? I said, well, we've got 80 pigs, you know? And he's like, oh, thank you. You know, beautiful. You yeah. know, um, yeah, appreciate it. Whereas if he said, I've got six, he's going to be like, well, oh, you know, why do I wait, you know, wait to go shoot them? And I could have gone shooting and got, you know, 10 yeah, times exactly. if you guys got. But you can say, yeah, but right, we, we rolled 80 pigs. We had bloody good fun doing it. And he's like, beautiful. Thanks, boys. I'll see you next time, you know, yeah, compared yeah, to, yeah. right, you shot six pigs. Maybe next time um, I might let someone else on that's got dogs. Yeah, exactly. Or, we'll bring, you know, the, bring the rifles in. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, essentially, yeah. So it's, it's um, yeah, I remember I was talking to Benny. Benny Fenson about we shot all these pigs and I remember saying I said mate we can't tell anyone about this he's like what do you mean I said oh you know mate this isn't really hunting you know we're hunting our time with thermal and spotlight I remember Benny saying pull your fucking head in and I was like what do you mean he said we just had some of the best fun that you can have with your clothes on with a stick bait you know yeah, yeah. and I thought about it for me he's like no you're right you know like we went out with a couple of mates we had a shitload of fun we shot eight yeah. pigs you know, we're not denying what we were doing. Um, no. We just had a shitload of fun. And um, at the end of the day, then, you know, it's funny, like, you talk to a lot of people and it's like, no, nah, we've been doing it too. Or, you know, like, <laughs> it's different. Like, we wouldn't we wouldn't do it on deer, you know. Like, you know, obviously there's some animals where you hold a high respect for and that sort of stuff. Um, but, yeah, like, these these pigs, like, we're going out with five stick bows, about bloody 150 arrows, Um couple of good mates, a few good mates, okay, having a couple of beers, driving around, seeing some unreal country. Um, like we went in this one block where we got in a creek system, we we're just daylight walking through and shot a couple of pigs out of that. And then on the way back, we just bloody pulled up. Um, sun started going down and normally everyone would be like, oh, right, I gotta go home, yeah. Matt, we just pulled up, lit a fire, had some dinner. And as we were sitting there having dinner, the, the joint just lit up with pigs. Like you could just hear pigs blowing in every direction and it was like this is heaven right boys <laughs> you go to that fella to go that way and then, yeah off we go and we'll see you back here at daylight you know then no, come no. back and old mate's got no arrows i've got no arrows you got two sets of jaws hanging <laughs> off your body backpack you know old mate got chased by a pig you know um and it's just really good harmless fun you know yeah yeah it's really it was actually really good with joel too like um with Joel's, so Joel ran um, Ash and I through his course quickly mm-hmm. in camp. Um, and it took about five minutes. He said, I can just accelerate, just accelerate. It took five minutes. And um, so that night, that sort of stuff, like you get an opportunity and everything sort of, night time's good in a way because everything's a bit more focused because you've got yeah, nothing yeah. but that you target. Your life's just on like it, going, yeah. going through the shop process and everything like that, he was like pounding into us. And he said, um, you know, you could really – Put what he said into play, mm. and um, and at night time it just seems like it, you feel a bit more calm at night for some reason, you know. Yeah. There's sort of, there's not so much pressure, um, and it was really good seeing like you could actually say right, I do what he says, and you get the the result that he sort of strives for, and it's just like you know how good's that? Yeah, definitely. I think and, you're um, like, you get away. You're uh, like the night time is more forgiving for movement. In the sense that you've yeah. got the light on them, so they're not if, even if they look at you, they're going to be too blinded by the light, so they can't see you. So you've got more time to draw back and just kind of hold position and get into the right right positions, hit all your your target markets and go from there. Yeah, and that's right. And you can like I remember one thing, um, you know, because I've always been a snap shooter and that sort of stuff. And Joel ran me through it, and um, I was a bit shagged up because he's like, "Keep holding your bow, like, keep holding it back." And uh, <laughs> there's this pig at about ten yards, and. Um, this is actually daylight, but I was sort of first lights and sort of in between. And I remember drawing back on this big, he was quartering away at about yeah, 12 yards, and I just held on it. You know, did everything Joel said, um, and just held on. Like, I had all the time in the world, I had no reason to release. Like, I just just floated. If I had a pin, I was just floating on it, you know? Yeah. And, um, yeah, and then just through like tension up, back tension, just like it just popped off so clean. And mm. just remember the, the fletchings just. Like a bean just sort of zipped straight through exactly where I want. Pig ran five yards and died. That's incredible. And um, it was like it was the, the nighttime side of things was good because you were able to put that into play with less pressure mm. and uh, a bit more focus. And, you know, go back to camp and everyone's like, how'd you go? So, nah, I felt real calm. This was good. Good execution. You know, how many pigs you get? Oh, I got five and you get six, seven, you know, then just bounce that off each other. And, um, 
yeah, it's it's just bloody good fun. That's yeah, all it is. Incredible. Like, yeah. It's um, it's, it's funny because it's like this thing that I only just unlocked, but it's funny that you said that you've been talking to people and they're all like, "Oh yeah, we've been doing that for ages." <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. The, the secret, the secret underground of bow hunting. <laughs> oh, mate, it'll, it'll, like, no doubt, it'll, it'll upset a few people, um, because it's, it, it's not the, um, you know, it, the old correct way of doing it. But um, as the boys point out too, he said, "Well, everyone uses binoculars now. Yeah, um, mm. everyone uses spotting scopes." Um, people are using drones to find animals. Um, you know, you talk to the old school boys that, like, when they used to hunt out west, they used to hunt on full moons. Yeah. So okay. they like dam banks or not. You know, yeah. not really much difference. Um, thermal is they're, they're unbelievable that you yeah, can find crazy. Things, um, everywhere. But you know, if we wanted to do it without a thermal, we could. You know, be, you know, the result might be you know a few less critters, but we'd still be able to do the same. And still targeting those areas. Um, you know, yeah, like if, a, if you know your block, you can play it. Well. Oh, absolutely! Like um, the first time Benny and I did it, we didn't we didn't use sandals. We just we hunt all day, um, and we just took our headlamps and we said, right, I, it's, it's last light. Um, there's a you know could be a feeder there. Last light, he, you hear pig squeals. Said, right, I will. I know it off my heart. I will walk hundred yards, um, just about hundred yards away, then we'll sort of stalk in a bit. And you know, like don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to um, in a way like justify what we're doing. No, we no. Feel- about it and like, but we just it's just good fun like um we've anyone that's done it with us for some reason you laugh more you giggle more you have more <laughs> fun you, you get chased more by pigs you know yeah. for some reason, they just run the light so it's good fun when you shoot a pig or shoot a ball you got a hundred kilo ball running towards you everyone's just like running you know <laughs> it's like playing um chasey yeah. um you know it's and the light of knocks bloody shit up too so you get to see where the light of knocks go and um, you know, and, and all that, and everything's the same. You do everything exactly the same as you do in daylight. Um, then the beauty of it, though, the best part about it all, mate, is the second the sun comes up, you get to keep hunting. Then yeah, yeah. the second the sun goes, you get to keep hunting. And <laughs> by the end of the trip, like if we um if we shot straight, yeah, shit, we could have shot bloody double that, you know. Um, but. Yeah, when you get a group of blokes together, just having fun. You don't take it too seriously. You know, no, we're just no. running around, um, just having good fun. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say. If you haven't done it, try it because it, it is, buddy, it's something else. Yeah, definitely. Sure. I, I like if you've got the experience of, especially like what I had, where you can sit and wait for them to come in. That that was great for me. And I actually had the light on for ages. I didn't turn it on until like I turned on as I saw them coming in. And held the light on and they walked all the way straight into it and they were fine with it. They didn't seem to mind at all by the light. One of them, like the big boy that I actually ended up shooting, he was pretty aware of it. He's like, there's something something over there. Like you could see he kind of kept looking and he's like doing the little old side eyes and stuff like that. But he just he just kept coming in anyway. The grain was just too tasty. Well, um, yeah, that's right. So that's essentially, um, yeah, so you obviously worked out where they're going to be, what they need. Mm. Um, yeah, a lot of the big pigs, the big old pigs, Second, their light comes on, they're gone. They, yeah, they've okay. been shot at by spotlights and their um, Yeah, they, um, yeah, the second that light comes on, they're, they're out of there. Um, you know, and they're the pigs you'll shoot daylight. You know, you very rarely do you, are you going to shoot big, nasty old fellas at night time because they're too clever, even with night. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, unless you've got to, the only way you're going to get unstuck is a sour in season. Yeah, um, I got you. Yeah, you know, so but if we can, yeah, if we can get up with. Yeah, you know, sort of help the farmer out. You know, it's, it's sort of everyone says they're helping the farmer out, but you know, the farmers always say to me, he said, everyone comes to me and says, I'll get rid of your pigs like you're doing me a favor. He said, if I want to get rid of pigs, I'll load the gun up with SGs and shotgun and all day, and I'll just go and clean up the group boys, you know? Yeah. So yeah. when people say, oh, I'm doing the farmer a favor, like you are in a way, but you're not the main reason, you know? Um, no. So, but with what we do, like if you can, Show them a number of it and you know, prove that you've, you've made a difference. Well, he's always going to welcome you back, aren't they? Yeah, I think it's funny that a lot of hunters use the um, oh, I'll get rid of the, the critters as their back pocket, like, yeah, I'm doing you such a favor. Like, it's the it's the thing that why you should let me onto your block. And it's like, <laughs> no, that's the last thing you should say. <laughs> like, yeah, don't don't use that method, it doesn't work. <laughs> but yeah, oh, oh, oh. Like we, where I am here, like we get a few pig owners and that ring up or they'll drop letters in the mailbox and that sort of stuff. Can we come and, you know, chase pig? And 
Oh, they reckon out of every 20, there might be one one well written letter that you know mm. you actually respond to. You go, listen, like I, I quite happily just send a message back and bring them back. So, listen, mate, how many pigs here? Um, you know, th- thank you, anyway, but try somewhere else. Um, but then you get <laughs> a couple okay down the road. <laughs> I, I got one bloke, one bloke rang me one night or sent me a message on Facebook. And he's like, can me and me mate come out and smash balls on your place? And that's all he wrote. <laughs> and I was just, I wrote back to him and said, mate. I'm not even going to answer that, but you might want to work on your bloody your foreplay a bit because that was, you know, that's just not <laughs> didn't even lose yeah, me up, mate. No. <laughs> yeah, I actually, no. I, I, and caught, I remember talking. Oh. Um, yeah, sorry, go. No, I, I caught a guy on our block the other day. Um, when I was out there, how you know, these dogs in the middle yeah. of our block. They were actually, I heard the dogs and I heard the pigs going off. I'm like, what's going on here? And I'm like trying to listen because it was on the borders of the neighboring block. And I'm like, no, they're in our fucking block. And then there's a dog that started going off next to me, like up in my paddock. So I started running up to the dog. I grabbed the dog because it had a collar on. So it came down to me and found me once the pig ran off. It came down to me and it went to run off. And I heard him say, oh, just go get the ute. So he ran off and got his ute. I've grabbed onto his dog so I knew he was coming to get it anyway. I'm going to have a word with this guy when he comes over. <clears throat> and he's like, oh, you must be blah, blah, blah. And he's like, oh, well, yeah. And started carrying on like he knew, um, knew my family, knew my uncle and stuff. And so I got his name, got his number, told my uncle about it. And he's like, he's not welcome here. He's asked me. He's asked me plenty of times. And I've told him he's not welcome on the block. The dogs were literally a kilometer into our block, like <clears throat> in the block where all of his um, all of his breeding heifers are that had just been all impregnated yeah. and everything. So he's like, yeah, he, he flipped his flipped his absolute lid and he's like, I'm glad you got his number and he ripped him a new one. I'm like, good. Like, really, if if we as bow hunters got caught a kilometer into someone's paddock and just said, Oh, sorry, mate, my bow took me here, like it's not acceptable, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. If you're gonna if you're gonna hunt with dogs, you also have to control your dogs. That's your yeah, that's your hunting tool. So you need to be able to control that. Um, but yeah, I, I was also like just don't go too extreme on him because I don't want to get shot. <laughs> They're walking yeah, around with well, guns and I've got a fucking bow. <laughs> well, that's it too. Like, um, no matter how good you are with dogs, like, you know, dog doesn't know where he's going. Like, he doesn't know where he's meant to be. Um, yeah, exactly. Another fence is just another fence. Like, um, one of the properties I hunt down here, the older fella that owns the place, like, always got poachers out there. Always, like, I'll go out there hunting and I'll spend, because no one lives there, but I'll go out there and, um, go camping and hunt every night, just about midnight. Got to get in the ute and do your lap because you'll see lights and shit. Oh, yeah. and, um, he was out there one day and he caught these blokes and I don't know if they're pinching goats and you know dogs and that sort of stuff. And and um, he's not an old fella, but he's sort of getting on a bit. And he was by himself and there was three blokes and one leant in and took the keys, tried to take the keys. And he's like, "Well, you know, I can tell him to leave, but I can't really tell him to leave because there's three of them, one of me. Mm-hmm. You know, everyone that sees the hunt and they've either got a knife or a, or a gun." You know, no yeah. one goes hunting with that one. Um, but the, and that's the other thing too, like with with the thermals and that. Um, you're out, of, you're out at that time of night when everyone is either trying to be doggies out, and <laughs> the, the shit you see, like you you can't get away. You know, you can't hide from them. Um, like if if we're hunting the same party, like so, you say Ash is with me and Benny and um, White, just say they're you know, KOA in the same paddock hunting pigs, you know. So, right, you boys are over there, we're over here. You can see them as clear as day, you know, walking yeah, around wow. and stuff. If someone was, yeah, trying to be dodgy and walk around with dogs, that sort of stuff, yeah. you can, And you can feel them through those um, thermocles, I think. I think you yeah. can. Um, so, yeah, like, you, it's probably not a bad thing. Like, your people wouldn't be game because knowing that oh, there might be these crazy ass bones out here with thermals, you know, we might get <laughs> <down. laughs> Become vigilantes. Yeah, <laughs> mate, I've got one last uh, story I need you to go on about, which is um, how big is your calling hole horn? My calling horn, yeah. That um, that one of bloody I got off Toby's. I don't, I don't know. I, Randy just told me that I need to say how big's your calling horn. <laughs> <laughs> That's something Randy would say, wouldn't it? <laughs> I figured I you were going to come out with that. this great story. Yeah, no, no, that's just Randy Van, typical Randy, you know. Um, I don't know where he's going with that, I don't think, actually. <laughs> it, right. not that he probably thinks bloody something's going on, but no, I, I, got, I got a roaring horn off bloody um, Toby, one of those big ones. You horns. like it? Yeah, is it good? Uh, like, I can't call deer for shit, mate, to be honest. Like, um, <laughs> I've tried that. Um, <clears throat> I had a mate, we were hunting reds, and 
I bought that. I got one of the horns, one of the first ones, and on there, Spark, and I tried bloody cow horns, you know, PVC, poly, can't get anything right. And my mate rocks up with this bloody bit of his mum's vacuum cleaner hose and just mm-hmm. moans. And I haven't had a red respond to me. He uses this short little one. And, um, yeah, they all started falling back. So I just kind of <laughs> gift it, took me horn home. Um, yeah, I, I'm no good at it. But, yeah, as far as Randy's concerned, I've got a bigger horn than him. <laughs> uh, good one all right well mate that's been awesome it's been a, a quick two hours to be honest and i think there's some pretty cool insights in there um especially on the bow bow tweaking side of things and the the arrow tweaking side of things i think that's pretty insightful especially on the the trad side and we i mean i, I try to talk about that stuff in general when i interview the trad guys because there is such a varying um difference but at the same time i think a lot of the australian folk are starting to jump onto the same sort of bandwagon uh, especially around arrow weights and stuff like it's all becoming pretty similar and i think you guys are starting to talk quite a lot between yourselves as well because it's obviously working so well so um yeah something to definitely take away from today but jack where can people follow you where can they get your strings where can they buy the the um bow hunters domain <laughs> arrows where, where can they where can they get a cutting board and a table made from you? What's the what's the best way to find you? Basically, probably just on Instagram. Get on my Instagram. Um, our website for our arrows and strings, and that's just JS Custom Strings. Um, yeah, basically, if you got any questions, just ask me. Like, I'd rather someone come to me and ask me with a heap of questions, even if I think they're stupid, because if it saves them, you know, years of, um, you know, you know, pain and. You know, frustration, which is exactly what I went through when I started. So I'm more than happy to answer any questions, and I'll I'll answer anyone's question no matter how dumb they are. You know, um, more than happy to. So yeah, either that or Facebook. Um, everyone knows. Yeah, all my mates probably say go to me anyway. Um, I always say oh, <laughs> oh, on the stick I just go to Jack. So uh, yeah, yeah. Just your mate, I'll send them my way anyway. Exactly. So your Instagram is Jack Spinks underscore. Um, I'll chuck that in the show notes as well. Yeah, no worries, mate. I'm more than happy to like talk to anyone if they got any questions. And even if um, I was like thinking for even if you want to throw up a um questionnaire or something like that and get out the questions in and you know the podcast and answer them just to try and help some people out because even Benny Mars says there's not enough people helping people out nowadays. So um no, more definitely. Than yeah. No, awesome man. I appreciate your time, dude. It's been fun. No, nah, thank you very much for having me once again. Thirsty. <laughs>